We will now bring the, this meeting into public session. Oranya. I'm very pleased to open the, the, the public hearings of the Shannon Public Consultation Committee on travellers towards a more equitable Ireland post recognition. These meetings are the second part of the process, which began in May with a public invitation to make written submissions to the committee. On behalf of the committee, I wish to sincerely thank all those who sent in submissions on this important topic. I warmly welcome the fact that members of the traveller communities will today speak in the Senate for the first time since travellers were formally recognised as an ethnic minority. When the Irish state formally recognised the ethnicity of Irish travellers in March 2017, it heralded a new era of mutual understanding and relations, based on respect and on an honest, open dialogue. Today, in a follow-on from that milestone moment, these hearings are an opportunity for positive engagement with the traveller community as we shape our future. Through this consultation process, we wish to reach out, to consult with and listen to travellers and others, to consider proposals to support travellers full equality, post ethnicity, and make recommendations on the way forward. Following on from these hearings, a draft report will be prepared for the committee by our rapporteur, Senator Colette Keller. The committee will review the draft report and publish its final report as soon as possible. Today's public meeting will consist of two sessions under the following themes. Session 1, now, Traveller Participation and Politics. Session 2, 12 noon, Dialogue and Traveller Social Inclusion. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome the following witnesses to this first session. Deputy David Stanton, Minister of State for Equality, uh, Immigration and Integration. Mr. Martin Collins, Pavy Point Traveller and Roma Centre, Mr. Patrick McDonough, PhD student, Trinity College, Dublin, Ms. Kathleen Sherlock, Coordinator, uh, <coughs> Minister Whedon. Rosalie's not here. Rosalie's not here, yes. That's sh Kathleen is here, yes. Rosalie is not here, yes. Mr. Bernard Joyce, Director, Irish Traveller Movement. Ms. Joanna Corcoran, Galway Traveller Movement. Ms. Rachel Doyle, National Coordinator, Community Work Ireland. Ms. Anne Irwin, Community Work Ireland. Mr. Kevin Burns, CEO, Exchange House Ireland, uh, Ms. Minnie Connors, Wexford Traveller Development Group, Ms. Deirdre Barry Barker, Wexford Traveller Development Group as well, and Mr. John Nonigan, who is well known to us, I think, former Governor of Mountjoy Prison. You are most welcome, and we thank you for engaging with the committee uh, in its consideration of this important topic. Before we begin, I must draw your attention to the following procedural matters. Uh, firstly, the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of rare evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the Chair to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, in such a way as to make him or, or it identifiable. Uh, I also wish to advise that any opening statements you have made to the committee will be published on the committee website after this meeting. To commence proceedings, I will invite Senator Colette Keller to make a few introductory remarks at the beginning of this session. I will then invite each witness to make a short presentation to the committee. You may share your time with, with a colleague if you wish, and please indicate uh, this to me when you are invited to speak. I would ask that presenters keep their opening statements as brief as possible, because time is limited overall. When the presentations have finished, there will be time for questions and comments from the senators and responses from the witnesses. So now I have the pleasure in calling on our rapporteur, Senator Caleb Keller. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Lasko Hirlock, and like you, I'd like to warmly welcome uh, everybody here today. Grati Tom, Giles, Amuni, Fein, on Bjors, our crush, and Ned. Nedes Talox. I'm sorry now for ruining the language, but I've tried. And uh, 
I got those words from the lovely Owen Devorgin. I would like to thank people for coming here today from far and wide and, I, and for, I think, the record number of diverse submissions to this open call, all of which will be included and reflected in the inevitable report that we will produce. Thanks to my fellow senators, members of the Public Consultation Committee, members of the uh, Senate Civil Engagement Group and supporters across parties and independents. I want to acknowledge and thank Bridget Doody, Carl Judge and the Shannon team for making today happen and for the ushers for their great support today. I would also like to mention my little team, Ben, Sarah, Katrina, Hazel and particular thanks to the Irish Traveller Movement uh, and Traveller NGOs and above all Owen de Vardoon, who advised me and helped me put together a programme of work to advance traveller rights which I am pursuing in different ways in my role as Senator. On the 1st of March uh, 2017, it was a historic day for Ireland and for travellers. This was the first day when the state formally recognised the ethnicity of Irish travellers and in doing so ushered in a new era of mutual understanding and relations. When the then Taoiseach Enda Kenny spoke to the Dáil recognising traveller ethnicity, he said, our traveller community is an integral part of our society <laughs> for over a millennium with their own distinct identity a people within our people. He went on to say that recognition of travellers could have a transformative effect on relations between travellers and wider society. But despite formal, the state's formal recognition of traveller ethnicity and by extension language, culture and history, the everyday efforts that travellers make to develop their cultural literacies is systematically ignored in public and policy discourse. I'm always taken by the writings of African-American writer, civil rights activist and gay man James Baldwin writing on identity. He was a man who grew up in 1950s Harlem and also spent many years as a writer in Paris. He wrote, my inheritance was specifically limited and limiting. My birthright was vast, connecting me to all who live and to everyone forever. But one cannot claim the birthright without accepting the inheritance. Ireland's inheritance includes our traveller history and culture. We must cherish it, celebrate it and know it. For us as an Irish people to claim our birthright, we must cherish it, celebrate it and know it to redress the stigma, the long-standing prejudice, discrimination, racism, social exclusion and identity erosion experienced by travellers. We must move beyond stereotypes and begin uh, to bring into our awareness our unconscious bias through formal cultural awareness and reflection. There has been attempts at assimilation of travellers and den denial of difference. There has been segregation in many forms which make constructive conversations and dialogue well nigh impossible. Today we have an opportunity to do something different, to create a new narrative by having a different kind of conversation, a dialogue that systematically engages with traveller cultural literacies and seeks to appreciate and understand them to link the private troubles of travellers into the public issues that the state, government, agencies and bodies must connect with and address. The state looms large, particularly in the lives of travellers, and the onus is on the whole of society, the machinery of the state, government departments, agencies, public bodies, the Oireachtas, and for leaders and people in schools, hospitals, communities everywhere, everywhere to have such dialogues. Recognising the almost total absence of travellers in the Oireachtas, either as members or behind the scenes, or at least people who have self-identified as travellers, and with the same absence across the public sphere, this is why I, a settled person and not a traveller, sought to make space, make room, make common cause in different ways with travellers in my privileged role as senator, not to set an agenda or the agenda, or to speak for rather to listen and to use the power that I have to advance rights, justice and well-being and to be part of the gateway to an even fuller participation in politics and public life by travellers. It would be my privilege if travellers could and would consider and accept me as an ally, learning from you and the community as I go. So it is good that we are here today in Shannon, there in one of the houses of the Oireachtas, to have a good exchange, to speak, to listen, to come up with good ideas and proposals for travellers to be members of this house, to be members of the Dáil, to be councillors, to work behind the scenes, to reach the upper echelons and all parts of the civil service, Gardaí, judiciary, health and social care systems. For too long, travellers have been invisible in these worlds, 
excluded from these worlds, or even when in those worlds, hiding their honourable identity, like so many LBG, LGBTI people felt they had to do to survive. So as I end my opening remarks and we embark on our day of hearings, I give you words from two black civil rights activists. Martin Luther King said, nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Put more simply and directly, Maya Angelou told us, when you know better, you do better. Those of us on this side of the house today will be educated by travellers and others. Our consciousness will be raised. We have many important voices to hear so that we may know better and most importantly of all, do better. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for those opening remarks. And I now have pleasure in calling on Minister David Stodden to address us. Thanks very much, Chairman. Um, good morning, everybody, Senators, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for inviting me here today uh, to this uh, unusual but very important event. Uh, to speak at the committee hearings on the specific, specific theme of uh, traveller participation in politics. Um, these hearings, I am sure, promise to provide valuable insights on the current situation of travellers in Ireland and on issues needing to be addressed. Uh, you are aware of my long-standing commitment to improving the situation of travellers, both as Minister and formerly as Chair of the Giant Oireachtas Committee on Justice, Defence and Equality. I, I, I want to apologise at the start, Chair, that my diary won't allow me to stay for the full session. But, um, um, but I, I will actually take note of what's going on and, and, and record it later. But I will stay as long as I can. Um, significant progress has been made to recognise the contribution of travellers to our society. The recognition of travellers as an ethnic minority, as, as has been said by Senator Kelleher, uh, by the then Taoiseach in the Kenya in March 2017, was, was a landmark occasion. The historic debate that night on traveller ethnicity was memorable, each party acknowledging the significance of what was being done and of the importance of recognising and celebrating travellers' distinct identity within Irish history and life. As you may be aware, Chairman, I also chair the, national, uh, the steering committee on the, of the National Travel and Roma Inclusion Strategy, known as NITRUS. Um, and there's a, it's, it's, it's a published document. It's a living document as well. And I was glad to be able to invite Senator Kelleher to the last meeting of that. And I'm sure she will um, share with, uh, with her colleagues later on her impressions of what she saw at that particular meeting. And NITRIS is a whole of government strategy which I launched on uh, June 2017 and it's aimed at improving the lives of travellers and Roma communities in Ireland. It has been developed and is being implemented in a partnership approach with travel and Roma organisations so that their concerns are considered when national policy is being developed and so that co co collaborative responses can be put in place to address the challenges which remain to be addressed. The strategy contains a number of actions that relate specifically to this theme of traveller participation in politics. These actions were developed following an extensive consultation process during 2016 and 2017. That consultation process enabled a wide range of traveller voices to be heard on the actions needed to be in included in the strategy. The steering committee for the strategy is made up of departmental and agency representatives and of representatives of the traveller and Roma organisations. They have a role of monitoring each of the actions of the strategy. Departments and agencies ha have to report on progress on individual actions to the committee. NITRUS is being monitored according to a traffic light system which enables progress on each action to be clearly evaluated. In addition, specific actions have been prioritised for attention in 2019. These form an implementation plan for the, for the year and are subject to quarterly updates at the steering group meetings. There is no tokenism, Mr. Chairman, in the inclusion of the traveller organisations on the committee. The members of the committee and the traveller organisations are strong and influential members. Their role is a very important one in monitoring the implement implementation of the strategy. They can and they do call government aid departments and agencies to account on the delivery of the various actions. Their participation is vital as they can shed light on the actual experience of travellers at national and local level they are able to confirm whether or not initiatives are working in practice. The strategy commits my department to fund traveller organisations at national and local level, not only to represent and advocate for their community, but also to build the capacity within the community for the future. It is very important that the traveller community has strong representative groups who represent the community at all levels of society, be it nationally, locally or in the media. Such organisations rightly seek to improve outcomes for travellers, but equally they provide that, that crucial link for the state to interact with its traveller citizens through its various consultative mechanisms. 
They can also provide an alternative narrative to the criticisms that I know members of the community see, hear and read in the media on a regular basis. I see that, fund I see that funding as, uh, as of importance in developing capacity within travel organisations to undertake the particular political participation process with the national and local decision-making structures. My department chairman has a budget of 3.8 million euro in 2019 to fund travel and Roma community groups, many of whom are represented here, and national level NGOs. This funding is generally used to cover the costs of community development posts in traveller and Roma organisations. The funding has also been used to support traveller participation in decision-making and political fora. This is in response to the NITRAS actions 132 and 133 which are focused on supporting traveller and Roma people to participate in the political process at local and national levels and also to facilitate political engagement and leadership in their communities. More specifically, Action 132 calls on the Department of Housing, Planning, Community and Local Government to support, the, uh, to support of traveller and Roma organisations on voter education and voter registration um, initiatives for the traveller and Roma communities. In addition, Action 133 calls for the Department of Justice and Equality to support the development of mentoring programmes to build and develop the capacity of travellers and Roma to represent their communities at a local, <coughs> national and international level. The funding provided to Minister Whedon, for, for instance, allowed them to hold a conference on political participation in February of this year. I was delighted to be able to, uh, to address that conference and to launch their handbook on, on mobilising traveller political participation before, during and, um, and, and after elections. And I have a copy of the handbook here as well, Chairman, and people might, might like to have a look at it. The conference was held in advance of the local elections in May, and I know at that time they had two members of the traveller community committed to run in the elections, and I believe at the end the figure rose to five. I stand to be correct on that, but that's my information. Yeah. yeah, okay. I, I want to commend those candidates for taking the brave steps to run for public office. Regardless of the results, it is important <coughs> that young travellers, both male and female, see their community members taking an interest in and running for public office. I know that campaigning is not an easy task, and any of us here who are politicians know that. It's not easy. I am also responsible, Chairman, for the migrant integration policy and have supported initiatives to promote, to promote a migrant polit political participation. It is important that the diversity of our society should be reflected in the membership of the Oireachtas in, and in local politics. The progress that we have made to achieve better gender balance in politics shows that more balanced political participation can be achieved. However, if this is to be sustained, it will require the support of political parties and independence and of the electorate, of course. If we want to see Irish society reflected in our political institutions, we are dependent on travellers, migrants and women to be brave enough to take that giant step to run for public office. We as citizens, members of the traveller community and people who are not members of the traveller community, must also ensure that we are registered to vote, that we use that vote on the day and that we use that vote to ensure that all of Irish society is reflected in our institutions. So again, uh, I want to thank you for your invitation to speak to the committee today. I am pleased to see the range of activity being undertaken within Inster House on the situation of travellers in Ireland. I welcome the work being done by this committee, the Traveller Rockless Group and the recently announced Committee on Key Issues Affecting the Traveller Community. And I look forward to the reports and recommendations from these groups. Uh, I will ensure that they are included in the agenda of the NITRAS Steering Committee. And I know that Traveller colleagues here will also uh, ensure that happens as well because they are very strong and very vocal on the committee as they should be and as I encourage them to be as well. Um, I believe that working together in collaboration with traveller organisations, we can achieve better outcomes for travellers so that their contribution to Irish life and society can be properly understood and valued. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, I now call on Martin Collins of uh, Pavy Point and Roma Centre. On your vote, Martin. Uh, Minister, uh, Chairperson, uh, Senators, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Pavy Point Traveller and Roma Centre is delighted to have this opportunity to speak to you this morning at this very historic event and to press on you the importance of traveller participation in the development, implementation and evaluation of policies and programmes designed to address inequalities and racism and promote equality and inclusion. Pavy Point for almost 35 years has been working at a local, national and indeed international level in the promotion and protection of traveller and Roma human rights. One of the values which inform our work is a community development approach and at its core is creating the conditions for the full and meaningful participation of travellers and Roma in analysing, identifying our own concerns and issues and identifying potential solutions. In fact, Pavy Point Traveller and Roma Centre is based on the premise 
that there can be no, uh, no significant or sustainable change unless travellers and Roma themselves are empowered to fully participate and influence policy that creates positive change for our communities on the ground. To this end, Pavy Point has participated in a range of consultative mechanisms at local and at, and at national levels, dealing with very challenging issues such as accommodation, education, health, employment and equality. This is what you might call participative democracy, and I think we are all still challenged to identify how we might straighten and make more effective these consultative mechanisms in terms of policy development and policy implementation. It is vitally important, important that we enhance and further develop, develop a community development funding lines for autonomous community development. And this, work, uh, this work needs to be based on the All-Ireland Standards for Community Work in Ireland. In fact, many of the traveller activists and leaders who are presenting here today and those who are present uh, have been uh, a true community development uh, a process, and we are very fortunate to have such strong, articulate uh, travel leadership at local, regional and national levels. In terms of, in terms of travellers and Roma political particip participation, a lot more effort and work is required to support traveller and Roma participation in the political process at local and at national levels. Pavi Point has over the years, along with many other groups, engaged in voter education awareness initiatives to encourage travellers to register and to vote and to stand as either independents or as members of parties. Please note that Pavi Point is apolitical and we are not affiliated or tied with any political party. In June of this year, the Affirmative Convention on the Protection of National Minorities, a Council of Europe legally binding instrument, published its opinion on Ireland. And one of the recommendations that the Advisory Committee made and it calls for Irish authorities to consider, in consultation with representatives of the Traveller and Roma communities, legislative practical measures to create the necessary conditions for their political participation, including representation at all levels, to more adequately reflect the composition of Irish society and better take into account the needs of the Traver and Roma communities. Also, the OSCE, the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe, of which Ireland is a member, a member of, published a set of recommendations on the effective participation of national minorities in public life. This is titled the Lund Recommendations. These recommendations provide guidance to member states on how best to ensure the participation of national minorities within their states. The recommendations cover general principles such as participation in decision making, including arrangements at central, regional and local levels in elections, advisory and consultative bodies and self-governance structures. Chairperson, I am fortunate enough to have been appointed as a member of the Advisory Committee on the Fermi Convention on the Protection of, of National Minorities. Article 15 of that convention talks about the participation of national minorities in, 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 in various political structures. I've had the, uh, I was very fortunate to visit Georgia and, uh, and, uh, and Spain, and they have created very inclusive structures there for, for indigenous uh, ethnic groups in terms of uh, being involved in decision-making processes. Likewise, in Romania, for Roma, they have created a very innovative uh, structure where Roma have a voice in the national, in the national parliament. Likewise, uh, from reading material, uh, the Sami community have their own parliament in Finland. So there are innovative, innovative ways to create the inclusion and the participation and give a voice to indigenous ethnic groups such as travellers. And we can do that by creating affirmative action policies. Uh, we can look, for example, at having quotas of travellers in our national parliament. We can, have, we can look at the whole concept of reserve, reserve seats, which is a tried and trusted method of supporting the inclusion of, of indigenous groups right across Europe. And to, find, uh, to, uh, to conclude, I just want to take this opportunity uh, to, to highlight an example. Recently, as you know, uh, Dr Cindy Joyce was appointed to the Council of State. I think that was a really significant and a very symbolic uh, 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 development, and we need to see a lot more in, in, in that regard. I think when travellers look at our, our Parliament, at both houses of the Oireachtas, you know, we need to see our faces reflected, reflected in these parliaments. And if that were to happen, I think it would deconstruct, uh, deconstruct this notion that our parliament is the sole preserve of the majority population. So I look forward to the hearings. I look forward to 
uh, engaging in the questions and answer session. And more importantly of all, I look forward to the report and the recommendations that it might contain. And even more so, I look forward to the full implementation of those recommendations. We've had a lot of strategies, a lot of policies, but the challenge that remains is the full implementation. And if these policies and recommendations are fully implemented, there's absolutely no doubt they will greatly enhance and improve things for traveller and Roma community. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And now I call on Mr. Patrick McDonough, PhD student from Trinity College, Dublin. Where you go, Patrick? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chairperson. I'm Patrick McDonough, a PhD in Medieval History at Trinity College, Dublin. And I've been invited to contribute my opinions on how to strengthen travellers' participation in politics. This was one of my first, and I think, I think one of the first steps that would, I think would make an important difference going forward would be the creation of a senatorial seat for travellers, or indeed just one traveller as, as the preliminary steps. And I, this system and our current, uh, our current political system has, I would think, there's already in a similar case, currently the Universities of Ireland have six seats in regards to the Irish Senate. My own university, Trinity College, has three, and the National University of Ireland also have three, and, the, and Article 18 of the Irish Constitution provides for this. I think if a, if a similar proposal were made, for a separate article for, for a traveller's seat, it would be in line with this, and I think it would go for a first step, for despite the good work of, Minister, of Deputy Minister Staunton and Senator Kelleher, it is my opinion that the, the trust that tra Irish travellers would feel towards the Irish states, I would feel is, is more or less non-existence. I, that's not, obviously, that's not, of course, unique to the Irish state. It, it, it applies to the United, Kingdom's, United Kingdom, myself being from Northern Ireland. But I think, as a way forwards, it would make it a symbol because Irish travellers, when they look at our political system, they do not see Irish travellers' presence. Now, of course, there, is, there was, of course, Patrick McLaughlin, who was a TD several years ago for Donegal, and that, uh, whose mother and grandmother were Irish travellers, which was an important step. But, the, but he's an exception and a rarity, and there, isn't, there seems to be no sign that it'll, it'll be anything part of the mainstream. And it would be important, I think, for the four major parties, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, Labour, and indeed Sinn Féin as well, to increasingly select travellers to run at all levels, be it at council, TD or MEP, or indeed to also run separately for senator. And I think this goes on to my next point about the best way I think to strengthen Irish travellers' participation is in essentially in education. I'm the first in my family to go to university, and I'm currently the first to be asked to speak in this room. Currently, the, the number of Irish travellers in university is essentially non-existent. It's irrelevant almost. I'm one of quite a few. I'm currently the only one, I think, doing a PhD in Trinity College Dublin. Currently, Cindy Joyce is the only one from the University of Limerick to have, to have been awarded the PhD. And it's likely those them. I'll be very surprised if that number goes above 10 in the next 10 years. And, and I, so one, one of the main barriers, I think, is, is, is I would recommend the creation of an Irish Traveller Pacific scholarship, as at least be recommended and proposed, because when travellers do, of course, view the university system and indeed the secondary education system, they don't see a system that necessarily that fits in for them. It's barriers. It's not like their parents have went and can explain the system. And, and, and obviously, your barriers be that financial costs, this is fears of being identified as a traveller, and just will, will it actually, will, what does it actually result in? And I think there could be great work that could be done both between Irish travellers organisations and Irish state in promoting that. But I think the provision of a dedicated financial scholarship for Irish travellers on this island to study university would go a great deal in actually encouraging them. And once those people are entering the educational system and they're more aware of how this, this state organ operates, they're less mystified by how it operates. And they're more willing, I think, to affect change. And they're more willing not to be t lectured by someone else. Irish travellers can't expect others to speak for them if they're not willing to speak for themselves. And I think a gr a education, I think, w will be one of the great motivations in driving and changing that. And it is good to see that there are increasingly there are more Irish travellers attending third level education. But it's still a far, it's still a long, long way to go before we're, we're approaching anything 
actually approaching our proportion to population. 40,000 Irish travellers in the Irish Republic, 6,000 in Northern Ireland. There is under 200 attending the Irish universities, which is, a, which, which is an, an insignificant number. And I suppose linked to this, this idea of increasing traveller education is, I know that currently before the Shannon in the fourth stage, there's the Irish Traveller History and Culture Bill, which Senator Callagher and Senator Lynn Ruan have, have done some great work on. And I think that would be an important step because as well as those travellers entering education, if Irish travellers are to take part in the Irish states, they have to know their history in both the Irish state and before the Irish states. It's not that long ago that the, there was the myth that Irish travellers date from the famine. And then, of course, there's the idea of do the Irish travellers, is it from the Cromwellian periods? Is it the, is it the dissolution of the monasteries at the Tudor periods? And, of course, these are questions that can only be answered if more work are done in those areas and, and are to be taught. I mean, there are nomadic groups in late medieval Ireland. Catherine Sims, a former lecturer in Trinity College, has an article on nomads in medieval Ireland about O'Connors who, who were pushed to the west of Ireland. Are they travellers? It obviously it's to be difficult to say, but they're certainly a nomadic group. And I think by bringing in a bill that, that teaches traveller history and Irish, the history of Irish nomadism more broadly, I think it would help give travellers and other people who, who, from a nomadic background on this island just to see a way of how they fit in onto the history of this island. Because all too often, Irish travellers are seen as the aberration, the freaks, whatever you, you want to call it. So I think a problem that needs to be fixed, to be dealt with, or whether it be assimilation, or just pure, or, or by ignoring them. And I think by, by the introduction of bills like that, by the promotion of Irish travellers entering education, and, and by and encouraging them, whether through deliberate policy of, of deliberately selecting them for running in local elections, TD or, or above, and the creation of these seats, I think that would go, certainly it would mark a beginning of what was still quite a long journey to giving travellers a role in the state proportionate to our place and population within it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. I now call on Kathleen Sherlock, Coordinator, Minster Sweden. Away you go, Kathleen. Uh, thank, uh, thank you. On behalf of uh, Minker Sweden, I uh, can for travellers talk in Ireland's only all travel form. I would like to thank the Senate Public Consultation Committee um, on Irish Travellers for the opportunity to give Minker Sweden's input on today's discussion. Um, and also thank Minister Santon, who has been completely supportive to Minker Sweden and to the um, uh, better outcomes for travellers um, and all the ministers and senators that are here today. Thank you. Um, the area Minka Whedon will speak on is on the subject and parts of travel political participation. Um, before we get to that subject, though, uh, I will give a brief outline of who Minka Whedon is, our objectives and our work. Minka Whedon Can for Travellers Talk in Ireland's own, only to all travel forum was formed in 2004 with the focus of creating a safe space where travellers could come together to discuss issues affecting our community and identify collective responses to those uh, issues. Our membership is open to all members of the travel community. Our mission is to promote the recognition and understanding of Irish travel culture and identity as Ireland's only Indigenous ethnic minority group who have been part of the fabric of Irish society for over a millennium. We work towards the full participation and inclusion of Irish travellers in all aspects of economic, social, culture and political life in Ireland, where our community is treated with respect and equality. Our people can be proud and confident, of, confident to hold up their travel identity without fear or prejudice. We believe in equality and justice and work in solidarity with human rights groups and organisations. When we talk about the issues affecting our, our community, we need to be clear on what these issues are. These are critical issues about life and death, about survival, and not um, simply about culture and cultural identity, which is very, very important to the travel community, but the actual survival of our people. Uh, we currently have a total travel population of under 40,000 people. And that's an astonishing small number for a community of people who have been part of this country for over a millennium. To try to get grips on why the travel population is so small, we only have to look to the findings from researchers on the, on the, on the Irish travel community. 
uh, the, the 2010 All-Ireland Health Study, the ERSRI Report upon Traveller Community, Behaviour and Attitude Research on Travellers. From these researches, we know that 75% of travellers are under the age of 35. Half of all travellers will die before the age of 40. The remainder will only reach into our early 60s if we're lucky, with a tiny number reaching 70 years of age or beyond. Uh, this is painful and devastating reality for the <coughs> travel community. For this to be a reality in any community anywhere in the world in the 21st century would be shocking. That it's happening in Ireland, uh, one of the most developed and advanced countries in the world, is very, very difficult to understand. But understand that we must. That means looking directly into the experiences for the travel community in Ireland, um, what it is and the challenges our community f uh, uh, face. Uh, the deepening crisis in travel accommodation, the escalating uh, rates of suicide, chronic ill health as a result of poverty and poor living conditions, 84% unemployment, poor educational attainments. We're excluded, we're marginalised, we experience blatant discrimination on an ongoing basis because of our traveller identity. For decades, travel groups and travel activists have campaigned for fair treatment and equality uh, for, for um, and, excuse me, have, uh, have campaigned for the travel community. This continues to be an uphill battle as we see our community rapidly deteriorating before our eyes. As travel activists and development workers within the community, we are very aware that the travel community is going through a crisis situation, the likes of which we have never experienced before. We recognise that anti-travel bias that exists within Irish society does play a part in this crisis. However, it must be stated, as painful as it is, that the root cause of the result is of successive Irish government's actions and inactions relating to the travel community. <coughs> There's no community of people in Ireland that has been so negatively impacted by political decisions and political inactions as the travel community. And we certainly hope there never will be a community that experience that again. Minka Whitten is calling on political leaders and politicians from all political parties to recognise the underlying cause in the crisis situation the travel community is in and to take decisive actions and implement policies to undo the, the damage of the past and that will set about creating better outcomes for the travel community now and into the future. An important step was the Irish state's recognition of travel ethnicity on the 1st of March 2017. We we'll see that as a, as, as a forward move. Irish travel, political participation and partic uh, political representation. Minka Whitten recognised that for real change to happen for the travelling people, the travel community must have a voice in the decision-making arenas. To this end, over the past number of years, Minka Whitten has dedicated a significant proportion of our time and energy and work into raising the awareness of, political, uh, awareness of the importance of travel political participation within the travel community, delivering traveller-specific voter education training. In February 2019, we held a National Traveller Political Participation Conference, the first of its kind in Ireland, where we launched our <coughs> Political Participation Training Handbook, which Minister Stanton showed already, mobilising Irish traveller political participation before, during and after the elections. At, uh, at this conference, three traveller candidates launched their campaign for the 2019 local elections. As a result of the conference, two other, traveller mem two other members of the travel community also ran as election candidates. Having five members of the travel community running as political candidates was a historic, for, uh, historic event for our community. It's important to build on, uh, on this and support future travel political participation. Um, as a society, we have to recognise the, the challenges facing members of the travel community contesting elections, the anti-travel bias and, and, and how small our community is. Irish travellers make up less than um, half of one, just over half of 1% of the general population. There is a need to implement legislative positive measures to ensure travellers' inclusion in political participation at local and national level. Irish travellers remain largely excluded from decision-making and wider political process. 
Regardless of commitments in the National Travel Roma Inclusion Strategy, recommendations by the Advisory Committee for the Protection of the National Minorities, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, to date, our state has not adopted actions or positive measures to improve the representation of travellers in political uh, institutions and decision making. So our recommendations are for the state to undertake legislation and positive measures to ensure travellers' inclusion and political participation within local and national government, to reserve seats for members of the travel community within the Dáil, uh, Dáil Éireann, the Senate and local councils, to support traveller political participation and training and poli political represent re representation training. Uh, traditionally, travellers have, be have been on the margins of society, and we don't have a background in being part of the decision-making process. To address this, there is a need for an in-depth training within the travel community to get them ready to be political representatives. Um, to ensure meaningful consultation with the travellers' uh, organisations um, and enhance their role in developing and monitoring policy responses to travel, uh, travel development. To incorporate decision-making powers within travel consultative structures and resource independent national uh, independent national and local traveller organisations to ensure travellers are mainstreamed into a range of social inclusion initiatives at local and national level. To create employment opportunities for members of the travel community within all government departments and internships as a measure to address the 84% unemployment within the travel community. To implement effective hate speech legislation that specifically names Irish travel community that continues to be negatively impacted by discrimination and racism. To instruct strong measures to ensure travellers are not negatively targeted by political candidates in election campaigns. To develop, new housing, uh, to develop a new housing accommodation legislation, which will include sanctions for local authorities who do not meet their obligations on the travel community. Um, Department of Health, HSE, to publish and implement the National Travel Health Action Plan as a matter of urgency, including the establishment of planning advisory body for travellers' health with dedicated staff and budgets to drive its delivery and implementation. Alongside this, as a priority, the government needs to address the very serious mental health crisis within the travel community that is claiming far too many, that is fair, claiming far too many lives and leaving devastated families, including very young orphan children, behind. Thank you, Kathleen. I now also would like to welcome Rosalind McDonough, who has joined us since the start. You're very welcome. And I understand you'd like to say a few words. So over to you. Good morning, and, and thank you for the opportunity. As a graduate of Trinity College, I ran as an independent four times for the Senate. Although there was warm and well wishes for me as a traveler, the atmosphere was very hostile. I didn't have the social or political mobility or connection to find support or allies within the Arachtus, within the Senate, and therefore I was at a huge disadvantage. During those four years, at uh, different elections, I received letters, phone calls that were absolutely derogatory about my gender, about my ethnicity, and about my disability. One of the letters said that if I just went back to where I was from, and live on an island away from the rest of the population that the, the Irish democracy wouldn't be ruined with the last of me running. The experience of running as an independent four times while personally it was very fruitful, and I learned a lot. My honour 
I like the level. I can her with my colleague Martin Collins who highlighted the need for affirmative action and dedicated seats for drivers. And in closing, I would also add, there are no traveler civil servants. So there's no traveler senior civil, civil servants. And therefore, the impetus to elevate travelers into democracy still falls short of a gateway into politics. And I just feel, and I wouldn't be the first one to say it, having someone like Lynn, Lynn Rand from a, a very working class background has really enriched the, 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 the base in the Senate in various different ways. And in, in order to imbue a far more diverse richness within democracy, we need travelers. Now is the time, now is the moment, and we need courage as a political system to open the gates. That's the only one. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, I now call on Mr. John Lonergan, uh, former Governor of Mount Joy Prison. John. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I just want to bring, I suppose, my own experience. I was asked to, to share some of my own experience of prison. Um, I, the first comment I make, I think, is that from my experience over the years, crime and antisocial behaviour is probably the one thing that gives the greatest amount of oxygen to, to uh, negative. Uh, perception of the travelling community. Um, the media play a big part in that and, and uh, sometimes politicians, um, but the highlighting of an individual crime, if it is related to a member of the travelling community, will uh, arouse instant anger and a huge amount of antagonism, um, leading to a biasness and, and a prejudice. And that is, is one of the biggest single areas uh, that crime can play a huge negative uh, and have a huge negative impact on uh, perceptions and indeed attitudes of people. I found that um, w one of the one of the things that I found, and I just want to put it out on the record, um, that in, in some ways the more progress you make in in relation to integration, and uh, the greater difficulties you create in other ways. Because um, in prison in the old days, uh, I can go back 50 years, um, members of the travelling community were readily and easily identifiable. Um, they, they lived together often. There was a cell, believe it or not, in Mountjoy, an A division, known as the caravan. Um, and that got its name from the fact that maybe 10 or 12 members of the travelling community who were in prison uh, resided in that particular cell, and other prisoners christened it the, uh, the caravan. But you can see the consequences of that day, because they were stigmatised. Um, all the dirty jobs in prison in those days were given to members of the travelling community. And that meant that they were uh, unconsciously discriminated against, and they did not participate in a wide uh, variety of other activities. So the, 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 the prisoner community itself, uh, and this continues to this day, would have a very negative attitude to members of the travelling community. They, they, they would see themselves as better than. Uh, a real old Irish thing that I'm better than, and even that, that, that is even that can surface regu uh, regularly in prison as well, and that creates difficulty. Um, mm. The identity thing is something for the for the representatives of the travelling community, indeed for for our society in general, to to take on board. Because as I said, the the, the greater the the improvement is made and the greater progress in integration, um, the more difficult it is to identify. And as I was governor of Mount Chai for many years, there were many people from the travelling community in prison, and I never knew they were from the travelling community. Indeed, uh, the only time I often knew was when they said it themselves, uh, for, uh, sometimes in arguments, that they, they, they would argue that you were discriminating against them because they were. We wouldn't have this information. Uh, people don't understand often that the information that people assume comes with a person going to prison is actually not there at all. Uh, very little information, sometimes none. 
in relation to the background of people come with them when they're committed to prison. So the idea that the establishment has the information around the background of people uh, is not there. And so that, uh, that whole idea, I think, of identity is certainly a difficulty uh, in, in putting in place uh, facilities and, and, and supportive systems. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I came across was that um, one of the greatest uh, facilities to change uh, perception is involvement and participation, as, as, as people have mentioned. Um, I found myself, uh, some, uh, came across some amazing uh, uh, performances and, and achievements by members of the travelling community when they were involved in activities, uh, creative activities uh, in the prison, and educational activities in the prison, and so I, I suppose I, 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 I would identify opportunity as being crucial. But we, so you provide opportunity for people to participate. Um, the, the, the second element, a huge element of it, is uh, confidence. Uh, a lot of people from the travelling community that I met would not participate because they hadn't the confidence to participate. They didn't think they would be able to. They felt inferior or they felt lack of, uh, and, and that prevented them, even if they were encouraged, uh, they, they still found that, that difficult. So um, the whole area of health care was mentioned already, a huge issue. Um, in terms of prison as well, the one good thing, a positive thing about prison is that it can and does provide a lot of that sort of inter, uh, um, intervention that wouldn't take place on the outside. Um, but so health care would be a, a very significant element. Um, males in particular would be, uh, I would have found a different experience generally with women uh, from the tribal community in prison. They were certainly more likely to involve themselves in health care issues and looking after their health uh, rather than men. Men, not just confined to the, tra the travelling community, I want to emphasise, but men generally uh, don't and uh, are reluctant to participate in preventative medicine, uh, to go for checkups, uh, you know, preventing things happening. Prison is and has the opportunity to do that, uh, but it does need the involvement. So one of the difficulties is often getting the consent and agreement and it, uh, you know, a motivation of people to participate. Uh, the services are often there, but they're not availed of because people don't uh, come forward themselves to, make, to, uh, to uh, use the services that are there. Um, education is the very same. One of the definitely in my mind, just want to support Patrick, there is no question in my mind, but education is the most significant element of the whole change process. Uh, the more educated people are, the better they know their rights, the, better, the more confidence they have to fight for their rights, because sometimes you have to do that. Um, and then I suppose my last uh, comment would be in terms of the prisoner community itself. Um, that is a huge issue in relation to the education of the prisoner community itself in order that they are aware. Because believe it or not, I would say the greatest discrimination and the greatest amount of bullying take place in prison populations because of the culture. And the culture is irrespective of what wrong is done to you. Part of the culture is but you don't report it. You don't grasp. You don't rat as it's known within the prison community. That is a huge impediment to bringing about the type of equality uh, and the type of human rights that are absolutely essential. If you don't have the information, if you don't have the support, you can't often deal with the difficulties. So there are a lot of, of issues. Uh, the prisoner uh, community is a small community relative to Ireland. The number of travellers involved in the prison community uh, is also very, very small, but very significant. And finally, uh, my own experience is that uh, members of the traveller community find prison very, very difficult uh, because of its confinement, because of the whole, whole structures of prison. Uh, people who are used to uh, maybe open space, freedom, in that sense of freedom, they find the confinement of prison very, very difficult. John. And now, per excuse me, sorry, the stage. Thank you. My pleasure, of course, and thank you. Um, and now, call on Bernard Joyce, Director of Irish Traveller Movement. Bernard. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, thank you, Senators. And thank you, Minister. And, um, th and also, um, I'd just like to welcome members of our community who are in the audience today. As the Director of the Irish Traveller Movement, which is a national membership-based traveller-led organisation, I welcome the opportunity to present to you today on the matter post-traveller ethnicity, recognised in 2017. Our submission 
crosses all of the teams and makes a range of recommendations. But from here, I will focus on specific challenges to traveller quality opportunity to public decision making. There are many reasons that have either stopped or curtailed travellers from accessing and contributing to key decision making structures, locally and nationally. And the biggest cause is our experience of social exclusion and discrimination, which has alienated us from mainstream systems of governance. Ironically, all too often those decision-making structures have been at the heart of further marginalisation of travellers by either imposing draconian laws that have Im impacted on our culture, our nomadic traditions in a negative way. Critically, we have not had national political representation since the foundation of the Irish state and continue to be invisible within the political establishment. The invisibility of the, of the diversity, capacity and insight which we as travellers can contribute across all aspects of Irish life is contradictory to an open inclusive democracy and is not coherent with the recommendations by the, by the Advisory Committee for the Protection of National Minorities, the UN Committee on the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, CERD, and the former Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights, which noted the Irish state has not adopted positive action measures to improve the representation of travellers in political institutions and decision making. Despite the traveller community, activism has challenged inequality and has advanced politicised human rights movements underpinned by community development values that is best placed to advocate on the issues affecting our community. There are so many strong advocates within our community and are here today, some of whom are participating in local traveller accommodation consultative committees. However often the role is not valued. They have not been listened to or heard and at times often patronised in, a situation that, in situations some have walked out in recent years with no positive outcomes from their participation. These tokenistic, ineffective structures are counterproductive to what should be the state and the community's collective aim and cause huge frustrations given our experience of the crisis in mental health, suicide, homelessness, high unemployment and racism and our health stats with half our community only reaching beyond the age of 40. That's absolutely shocking. The impact has been profound. Travellers ask me and ask others, does your representation hold any value or worth? After all these years, we've had poor outcomes from our participation and this can undermine traveller participation and we are, we are in fact, are we in fact colluding with the Irish state, dominated by non-travellers on the status quo. Up to now, the political system has not created mechanisms to confirm the traveller voice, like gender quotas. We must be proactive in changing the system. This is why the following recommendations are important by the Irish traveller movement, and I'll go into them. There should be a designated place for travellers in the Shannard elected by the community. That a rapporteur for travellers should be appointed to the House of the Oireachtas, and there is, a, there is continu continuity to work on newly established joint committee on travellers. That a panel expert group be appointed, state partners and bodies, regulating bodies where, where in wherein participate matters of potential relevance arising, for example, the Rental Tenancy Board, the Broadcast Authority of Ireland, the Press Council of Ireland, the Enterprise Ireland, the Workplace Relations Commission. The Government will direct local authorities to ensure traveller representation in local democracy and tar actively target travellers on boards and, and committees and decision-making forums. Specifically, and I'll go through my final points, Carolock. 
In public participation in terms of public partnership network, the travel interagency inter committees across all local authorities and strategic policy committees, in tourism, heritage, sports, art, community development, enterprise, social inclusion. The re representation is visible and should not be restricted to voluntary efforts at Pacific national strategy, strategies to tackle traveller employment with a priority requirement on statutory bodies, semi-body agencies and public service would have to double their efforts and establishment of a paid internship for travellers across all public bodies. There is an adoption of universal ethnic identifiers across the government and departments of public services and government and public semi-state bodies. I just want to add, uh, Cahirlik, that being here today is a very historical moment. And just to acknowledge that, um, there are people who come before us, like Nan Joyce, who ran for elections in 1982. She never got here. But I think you know, that we, ha we are here. And I think it's really significant that we need to ensure that progression, those steps, are moved forward. Um, and I just want to maybe just add, just in terms of um, a quote by Martin Luther, Qu Martin Luther King. Um, sorry, um, it was actually Nelson Mandela. Um, but I think it's re really important. Um, to deny people their human rights is to challenge their humanity. And I think for travellers for so long, we have been challenged, but so has our humanity been challenged. So I look forward to the recommendations that comes out today, and also in terms of the implementation of those recommendations, in terms of traveller participation right across all sectors of our society, including the political establishment. Thank you, Cahirlux. Thank you, Bernard. I now call uh, Joanna Corcoran of the Galway Traveller Movement. Thank you very much. Right, so my name is Joanna Corcoran. I'm a member of the Travel Community. I live in Galway City. I'm one of the community employment supervisors with Galway Travel Movement and I've worked from a human rights and community work perspective for the last nine years. I'm, a very, pas I'm very passionate about equality and challenging social injustice and I'm willing to work to improve the situation for my community but I also need a system that is actually willing to work with me to address these issues. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to present to you today. According to the census of 2016, Galway is the county with the highest population of travellers in, in the country. The population of travellers was 4,245 individuals, representing 1.6% of the total population. For those of you who are not familiar with Galway Travel Movement, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about us. We were established in 1994. We're an independent traveller organisation for Galway City and County, made up of travellers and non-travellers. We've worked for more than two decades to challenge and respond to the structural inequalities experienced by the traveller community. GTM's work has always been rooted in an understanding of and respect for the distinct culture and ethnic identity of the traveller community. It's important that the official recognition of traveller ethnicity is translated into tangible improvements in the situation and experiences of the traveller community. GTM's vision is to achieve full equality for travellers and the participation of travellers in social, economic, political and cultural life, as well as the broader enhancement of the social justice and human rights. So, to get to the subject of promoting and supporting increased involvement of travellers in decision-making process within the public sphere, the Goy Traveller Movement recommends that the Irish state needs to ensure the meaningful inclusion of the voice and the perspectives of the traveller community at all levels of decision making. To ensure that the traveller participation is meaningful, checks and balances need to be put in place and systems that, to be developed that would ensure transparency and accountability. We need to ensure that members of the traveller community are protected under all legislation. We need to ensure the full participation of travellers in political and public life at local, regional and national level. This needs leadership and resourcing at, at an interna institutional level. The barriers to traveller participation must be removed. A greater value needs to be put on the expertise that the traveller community bring to the decision-making table. Traveller cultural action needs to be meaningful. There should be an independent assessment carried out on all legislation and policies that have a negative impact on the traveller community or on the expression of traveller culture. Legislation and policies 
found to have neg negative impact need to be uh, reviewed in line with the IREC 2014 Act. Equality outcomes for traveller community needs to be prioritised across all social policy areas. GTM calls for the full implementation of the public sector duty as defined in Article 42 of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission Act 2014, which reads, a public body shall, in the performance of its functions, have regard to the need to a. eliminate discrimination, b. promote equality of opportunity and treatment of its staff and the persons to whom it provides services, and c. protect the human rights of its members, staff and the persons to whom it provides services. The development of a new national anti-racism strategy would be essential to ensure that equality issues for the traveller community are mainstreamed. There needs to be an interdepartmental cross-sector approach to eliminating racism against the traveller community. We need to develop and enact hate crime legislation where travellers are named for specific protection. We need to ensure that traveller children's rights are protected as part of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So, Traveller representation on the local traveller accommodation consultative committee, which as set out in the Housing a Traveller Accommodation Act 1998, which Barney just talked about a bit. Those members of the traveller community are represented on the LTACCs, but were not protected from very real anti-traveller discourse that's allowed and accepted in these meetings. The negative attitude and prejudice that is widespread in I Irish society gets reflected within these meetings. And this is something I personally have experienced firsthand as a local rep. This should not be allowed to continue. The power imbalance needs to be redressed. Respect and dignity being central values for success and all representation. <coughs> GTM recommends a full review and overhaul of the LTACC to include, but not limited to, the development of an agreed terms of, of reference, the development of a communication strategy and working protocol for members, monthly progress reports to be circulated to all reps, Anti-racism, equality, non-discrimination and cultural competency training should be provided and mandatory and repeated at regular intervals for all staff, LTACC and housing SPC members. Meaningful participation in the decision-making with a view to getting real results for the traveller community and public accountability, for an LTACC which is accountable to the traveller community. GTM has produced two reports detailing the violation of the traveller community human rights in relation to living in substandard conditions on most of the Galway city and county Halton sites and group housing schemes. You can get a copy of those reports from us if you just email us. Um, the experience to date has been there's a, lack of, a complete lack of political will to deliver on tra traveller accommodation programmes. Traveller children, young people and adults should enjoy an adequate standard of living compatible with a life of dignity. Traveller children should be able to live and grow up in a safe, healthy, sustainable and child-friendly environment that supports their developmental and learn need, learning needs. So just in conclusion, we'd like, we need to challenge structural inequality in all its manifestations. Members of the travelling community should have a right to participate. There needs to be public campaigns to address the negative uh, public attitudes towards the traveller community. And members of the traveller community need to be central to the development of any such programmes because there should be nothing for us without us. Members of the traveller community need to be legally protected. I want the recognition of my traveller ethnicity to be more than symbolic gesture. Our culture matters and we are proud. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. And now we have both Rachel Doyle and Dan Irwin from Community Work Ireland. Are you sharing time? Yes. Two and a half minutes each? That's fine. Okay. We're doing a double act here this morning. That's all right. Away um, you go. So, uh, Rachel. Uh, Cahirlach and members of the committee, senators, um, thank you for inviting us to present this morning on key issues of significant importance uh, for travellers. Um, we just want to do a, a, a quick background to our own organisation, um, present some of the issues in relation to the, the participation of travellers in, in decision making um, and also present some recommendations, some of which are in our submission that we've already sent in. My own name is Rachel Doyle, as you've said, I'm a community development worker and I've worked um, and been involved in traveller organisations for about the last 25 years, um, as has my colleague Anne Irwin, who will present later. We've both also been involved in the production of reports recently, myself uh, writing the report on traveller women in prison, 
uh, produced by the St. Stephen's Green Trust and Anne, um, a recently produced publication on travellers and horse ownership. Our own organisation, Community Work Ireland, is a national network that supports and, and promotes community development as a means of intervention for social change and equality. So we're a national membership organisation of community workers. Um, commun just to say a bit about community development and Martin and and Bernard have both referred to community development as an underpinning process of the work of many traveller organisations. So community development is a discipline, it's an internationally recognised approach to promoting equality, social justice and human rights. Community development works from the principles of participation, collectivity, community empowerment, social justice and sustainability. Ability, um, human rights, equality and anti-discrimination um, and we look forward to the forthcoming production of the new strategy for the, which the Department of Rural and Community Development are about to, uh, to publish on community development and supports for the community sector because this will be very relevant for work with travellers. Over the past 35 years our organisation has held strong ties with the organisations here ITM, the National Traveller Women's Forum, Pavi Point, and people working in those organisations have helped to shape our organisation and to shape community development in Ireland. Travellers have led out on a lot of that work um, over the past three decades. <clears throat> And, and in turn, Community Work Ireland has tried to, I suppose, share that space in terms of promoting rights for travellers as well. Um, a key focus of our work is in ensuring that the voices of those who experience the highest levels of social exclusion, inequality and discrimination are present, listened to and heeded in the decision-making and policy-making structures and processes that affect their lives. Anne is just going to run through some of the key issues in relation to this theme. So just in terms of a number of, of issues, both from the perspective of our work with Community Work Ireland and the perspective that we both share as non-traveller members and supporters of the, the traveller movement. And when Galway Traveller Movement was established in, in, in um, 1994, both Rachel and I were very, very involved in that. And we would say that despite developments towards advancing the position of travellers in Ireland, obviously most notably by the formal recognition of traveller ethnicity and the more recent launch of the, Nav the National Traveller um, uh, uh, Travel and Roma Inclusion Strategy, it's clear that little has changed for many travellers. The experience of oppression, discrimination and racism by travellers are well documented and acknowledged nationally and internationally. And whilst these themes will be discussed in the next session, the issues are pertinent and require a specific attention when discussing the matter of traveller participation in decision-making processes within the public sphere. And as Joanna has already alluded to, such processes and the structures, committees and boards established to promote them are frequently reflective and representative of society at large and the attitudes and values that prevail. And therefore, it's not surprising that the experiences of travellers, while some are positive, the very many of them, the vast majority of them, can be characterised by travellers not being listened to, um, tokenism, frustration, all the way up to experiences of obstruction, direct hostility, expressions of prejudice and discrimination from non-traveller committee members in a range of fora. We feel we need to ask how people are appointed to decision-making committees, particularly those that affect traveller lives at local and national level. In many instances, there appears to be no prerequisite that members of these committees have any track record in the promotion of equality and human rights. And indeed, as mentioned, some are proactively anti-traveller and hostile to progress with regard to traveller rights. We'd also like to draw attention, as Bernard has already done, to the fact that represent, representation by travellers tends to be limited to traveller-specific committees and traveller-specific issues and themes. And we would argue that this needs to change so that traveller voices are heard in a variety of fora dealing with a variety of themes, such as planning, arts, culture, climate change, etc. 
You will hear later from the National Traveller Women's Forum, but we would like to take this opportunity to highlight the need for a specific focus on traveller women in the development of any programmes or policies seeking to promote the participation of travellers. As highlighted by the National Traveller Women's Forum, traveller women play a central role in traveller society. Within the traveller movement in Ireland, traveller women have played a significant role in the development of traveller organisations and in this arena have made a valuable contribution to the, to the improvement of lives of travellers. Over the last 10 years, a significant number of traveller women have progressed from working in traveller organisations in a voluntary to a paid capacity, representing a significant and positive development for both women, traveller women and traveller organisations alike. The National Strategy for Women and Girls, the monitoring committee for which my colleague Rachel sits on, notes that if women are to change their circumstances fundamentally, they need to have greater access to the levels of power across Irish society. We also need to ensure that disadvantaged women, older women, women with disabilities, traveller and Roma women and migrant women can participate in key decisions concerning their lives. And it states, in view of the historic underrepresentation of traveller and Roma women in leadership, in leadership positions, measures will specifically be taken to provide great, greater opportunities for traveller and Roma women to participate in leadership, including in the community and voluntary sector. And just a final note for me before I pass over to Rachel to talk about just a, a short number of recommendations, just a note on the critical role that community development has played in the development of leadership within the traveller community. As a number of my colleagues have already stated, community development is usually behind many of the traveller leaders that have emerged um, over, the, over the past number of decades, and we would strongly suggest that, that specific support should be given to this. Thank you very much, Anne. And we now move on just to... Kevin Bourne. So, sorry, Chairperson. I just wanted to finish with a couple of recommendations, if that's okay. We'll, we'll allow that, even though you're gone two to three minutes over time. Sorry. sorry. Okay. Um, they did tell you. They did warn you. I hope they did. They certainly did. There. It's our fault. As these um, senators know when it comes to time. <laughs> senators, you're very welcome. We'll come to you in a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so we're just, in terms of our recommendations, uh, we are calling for a gender focus in relation to any, any actions or, or initiatives in relation to, 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 to today's hearings and um, positive action to address the deficit in the area of policy and decision making for travellers. Um, we're, we're, we're recommending as an immediate first step a quota system for travellers on public decision and policy making structures. We're recommending an audit of the experiences of travellers who are now participating on these structures to see what their experiences are like and what kind of review of structures is needed. Um, sanctions for those on decision-making bodies who make anti-traveller statements or encourage anti-traveller statements to be made. Community development funding for autonomous, that's crucial, autonomous community work with travellers where travellers have an independent voice outside of the state. Um, Again, to highlight the public sector equality and human rights duty, that public bodies need to be brought up to speed on their uh, responsibilities under the Act and ensure that they operate in a ma manner consistent with the duty. We're calling for resources to traveller organisations to provide training on anti-racism to public decision-making structures. Um, also, the immediate uh, implementation and additional resources for the National Traveller Roma and inclusion strategy and also and I think this is one that that we all really need to kind of get behind I suppose is the development and implementation of a new national action plan against racism the last one finished in 2008 we need it for travelers and other minority groups thank you thank you very much now on to Mr Kevin Byrne CEO Exchange House Ireland Kevin Hello. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the committee for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm here representing Exchange House Island and to add our voice to the excellent submissions you've already heard from the, a lot of the partners we work with, uh, and I'm sure excellent submissions that you'll hear later today as well. Exchange House Island National Traveller Service is an organisation of travellers and non-travellers uh, and leading provider of frontline and support services to some of the most marginalised travellers in Ireland since 1980. We are a multidisciplinary frontline service and we provide education and training services, children and young people services, family support and crisis intervention services, addiction services and the National Traveller Mental Health Service. We also deliver partnership services through training, provision of expertise and dual working with other organisations to provide services to travellers in Ireland. Our aim is to break down some of the barriers and discrimination in order to facilitate travellers to access 
the range of the services that they need in an equitable way. And I think that's one of the key things, is that we notice in our day-to-day -day work that it's not about travellers not trying or not, not wanting these changes to take place, but the barriers exist, and it's very, very difficult for them to, to break those barriers down without the support of some of these structures. And I'll go into that further. Uh, we utilise a distinctive multidisciplinary approach, um, the, and we work with a service user group who often face multiple social issues and barriers. We, we have a skilled staff team throughout the organisation who can work with members of the Shrabber community to escape positive outcomes. Um, I'll go on to We support a number of the recommendations to, that we've already heard today in relation to there being clear representation of travellers, whether that be in the Senate, whether it be in the Oireachtas, um, in the Dáil. We believe that there should be a rapporteur for uh, travellers to be appointed to the House of the Oireachtas. We believe that there should be, we should establish a specific national strategy to tackle travel unemployment with the pr priority requirement of statutory bodies, STEMI state agencies and public services to proactively employ, employ travellers. It is important that this is seen in the context of decades of exclusion, meaning that there have been multiple barriers, both tangible and intangible. We are coming from a point of view where that employment has not been there and has not been there for, for a long period of time. So therefore, the changes that we need to make are big changes. Without the big changes, that is not going to happen. When a group have been excluded in the large part from this type of employment for years, it takes more than a slight opening up to change things. There needs to be a commitment and resources with high-level support to harness the knowledge and skills that the members of the travel, travel community have. By putting in high-level resources over the first years, it would mean that successes would then become the future support network as others follow in their footsteps. It is extremely important and it is, it is an example of if you don't see it, you don't think you can be it. We work with a number of young travellers within our organisation and we want to we are constantly trying to show them that they can be these things, but without the support at a structural level, they are not going to believe that. We think we should hold to account the requirement of the public sector of duty and for the Minister of Social Protection to direct the establishment of a paid internship scheme across public bodies by directly targeting travellers. Without doing this, we don't feel that it's ever going to happen. You can, you can say that it's open to everybody, you can continue to, to, to make those claims, but without clear policies that are, are putting in place a pathway, that, that, that's still not going to take to happen or take place. We also believe that we should look at the issue of hiding ethnic, hiding ethnic identity and why this is taking place. We believe that you should offer support networks to people in employment and apprenticeship roles so they do not feel isolated and they are able to voice the concerns and the barriers. Some of these concerns and barriers are the reasons why often people are hiding their ethnic identity because they do not want to lose the position that they are in. Uh, we should be willing and able to address the inevitable bumps in the road without giving up on schemes or other people, uh, because this gives the message that you are happy to provide additional and well-needed support until things become difficult, and then it is no longer worth it. You've got, it's about sticking with it. It's about understanding that when you're trying to make a big change, when you're trying to, to uh, involve people who have been excluded from society for such a period of time, there will be bumps in the road, and we have to stick with these things. One of the things I, I, I looked at uh, in regards to getting more travellers onto, into employment and, and into roles where they can make a difference, um, if people may have heard of in the NFL American football, they had a problem with getting head coaches from minority backgrounds. And they, they implemented what was called the Rooney Rule. And under this rule, head coach positions they, uh, that, that became available, they had to interview candidates from ethnic minority backgrounds. A version of this or something similar would give opportunities of fair interview to travel candidates for statutory roles or internships. By offering the interview, the, even just the interview, you are making a change. This would mean that, you would gain, that people would gain experience of interviews and panels at that level, and that it would mean that the people that are doing these interviews and making these decisions would begin to see the talent that is there within the travel community. This should be in addition to reserved job roles and internships for travellers, as without big changes like this, it will be impossible to reverse the decades of overt discrimination that has been faced. The benefits in regards to this would both uh, 
to both employment and relationships between travellers and the majority population would be huge. I think it is only by getting prominent travellers who have the skills and the knowledge into these positions, working alongside the majority population, that is how you make the change in society that we all want to see. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Kevin. Now, uh, finally, Minnie Connors of the Wexford Traveller Community Group. Or, Traveller Development Group, excuse me. Sorry. Over to you. Thank you for inviting me here today to speak to you. You've already got the social and political submission from our group. Now I want to tell you the context of where they came from. I'm a 40-year-old traveller woman. I was brought up in a trailer with my parents, five brothers and seven sisters. They were the happiest days of my life, living out in the open air with our horses, dogs, chickens and goats and all my extended family around me. Back then, we lived without water, electricity or toilets. My extended family are now living on the same site I was raised on, in four trailers without water, electricity or toilets, so nothing has changed in a generation. I went to school in Wexford, the same school my five children have attended. When I left at the age of 12, I could not read or write, but in youth reach, I learned to read and write in a few weeks. The very same thing has happened to my children. They have been treated as special needs from day one. They don't get the same lessons as other children. They don't learn Irish. They don't get homework. They are told to colour in pictures, play computer games. They stay in at playtime to avoid discrimination. The same level of abuse and bullying is still there. If a child touched off me in school, they had to touch off on someone else to get rid of the traveller germ. A generation later, this is what my children experience every day. When I had three children, I was living happily in a caravan on the family site when council officials told me that if we didn't leave, they would impound our caravan. I would have to go to a women's refuge with my three children and my husband Jim would have to go into a men's hostel. Getting a landlord to rent to a traveller family is near to impossible. The council offered the alternative of going into a council house in a group housing scheme of 10 houses built especially for traveller families. All the other traveller families have been replaced by settled families and my family and I are now isolated on that scheme away from our own community. We accept that there are many things we need to change in our community and our culture. For example, we want to give travelling children the best chance in life. Yet there are priests in this country who charge 1,000 to 2,000 euro to perform fake marriages on underage traveller girls and boys, taking advantage of our anxiety about protecting our culture. I have had breast cancer. My GP did not examine me when I presented with a lump. He gave me antibiotics. I had to see five different doctors before I could get a mammogram. Then the cancer was discovered. I still have to have the support of settled friends to get doctors to treat me properly as a person. I am one of the 83% unemployed in the travelling community, claiming social welfare. When I attended a social welfare appointment recently, the officer tried to get me to sign a document I had not read. It was a contract with Taurus Nua to do a course I already completed the previous year. When I asked for time to read it, I was accused of pulling the traveller card. If I, didn't sign, I, if, I, if I didn't sign, I was told that an old signature of mine would be put on it. When I said I had the opportunity to do a counselling course to assist the traveller community suffering with mental health issues, she told me travellers don't want to work, they just want welfare. It is so destroying to be treated in such a disrespectful way by a person in a government department. You are hearing from me today because my beautiful sister Alice took her own life last year. She was 24 years of age. She was the ninth suicide in my family in the last 30 years. Suicide in the travelling community is seven to ten times higher than in the settled community. In spite of this, governments do nothing to deal with the crisis. There was no help for Alice when her crisis arose. We were told half hour before she died that because it was a Saturday, she would have to wait till Monday to see her own family doctor. She had already seen her doctor two days before, to no avail. There is, no, there is still no support or help for our shocked and traumatised family. The school advised me to just act normal. 
although both my children had been in the house that morning when Alice was found dead. Healthcare professionals do not understand traveller culture. <coughs> One counsellor attend I attended told me she had never counselled a traveller before and would need training to work with them. We all desperately need culturally appropriate mental health service. Our entire way of life is being stripped from us and we are still held in contempt by the settled community. Travellers have a fear of organisations like Tulsa. After my sister's death, I went to see the Traveller Mental Health Coordinator. Her response was to report to Tulsa that my family are living on a site without basic amenities. This filled us with fear that the children would be taken into care. This has been the experience of many traveller families in the past. As an example of traveller culture, horses hold a special meaning for us, but we are hounded for owning them. Last week, my brother's horse was legally grazing in a field when it was cut from its ropes and taken. Two days later, he traced it to the pound in Cork. He proved he was a legal owner, but then was told that she had died during the night at the pound, even though a vet had reported the horse in good health on arrival at the pound the previous day. To travel life in Ireland is a constant daily struggle to be treated with respect and dignity like everybody else. Every day, it takes every ounce of our strength to battle against the feelings of shame and worthlessness that are heaped on us wherever we go. Recently, I attended a party held for Syrian, Syrian refugees hosted by the local council. It was so nice to see them welcomed and their culture was being respected, but I could feel the hurt and disrespect that I had felt throughout my life. Why can't the same respect be there for me and for my people? Thank you. Thank you, Minnie. For that, and now I thank you all for your presentations. And uh, we'll go over to these illustrious people now on my right. Colleague, dear colleagues, all very welcome, of course, and thank you for your presence here today. And some of you, I'm sure, will have questions. And all I would ask is that you keep them very brief and to the point. So, who would like to go first? Maureen, or oh, sorry, Maura. Maura, and then. Jo Oh, okay, you know. right, okay. Senator Mara Devine. <laughs> Hi, how are you all? And uh, you're KB Lefolche. You're very, very, very welcome. Um, I just have to commend, I suppose, the wonderful rapporteur uh, that is Colette Kelleher and uh, her establishment of the Oireachtas Committee, the recent establishment of it that I went to the launch of it. So let's hope we get somewhere um, with what today's proceedings will bring. Um, I, I, I'm picking up on a few points, just Kathleen, that you talked um, a bit about, I suppose, the surveys and the, the, the mental health issues. Um, I, I was posed uh, this life for a long time, psychiatric nurse, so I have my own kind of issues maybe, but also looking in rep retrospective of how travellers are f treated within the health service that uh, many so eloquently and, and sadly talked about. Um, and the, the issues of traits that settled people see not belonging to them, but we actually begin to diagnose the traits of travellers as, a, as something apart and also as something in, in the psychiatric sense as something that needed to be treated. And I think we've come a long way since I started out as a student nurse, but we've still a long way to go. Many your, um, your heartfelt story of access and health care for you, vital health care for yourself, for yourself. And the survey as well, the, the recent survey shown the, the increase and in the massive suicide issue in, in the traveller community. And is there one thing that can be done to get that message out there? I know a lot has been done around the circles, but it's not impacting on the community itself. Um, it, it, in comparison also then, I suppose, with the prisoner issue for uh, John Lonergan and that um, a lot of mental he ill health is cap captivated in the prison and that they're captivated and it's not treated as a mental health issue either. Uh, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, okay. Um, to go back to then the reduced timetable that is illegal in education in post and primary schools and uh, absolute expulsion and what you think and what you believe, Minnie, you talked about uh, schooling for your children and what you think, believe, would actually how that impacts to, on your kids later in life to feel so different and to, um, to be alienated. I think alienation is, is one of the words that's come 
comes to mind in the massive implications of the negative uh, experiences in, in edu education. I know I have a lot. A accommodation, the underspend 50%. I mean, my area, Dublin South Central, we had three. We had the one behind Guinnesses. We had um, St. Michael's Estate. But we have Labra Park, and it's redevelopment 15 years in the making. It's again, again stalled, and 50% of those that, that goes back into the exchequer. And surely we should, what do you think of penalising local authorities when they don't spend on traveller accommodation and also for the money that they don't spend, give it to councils that are willing and able to spend it as opposed to get it swallowed back up? It's all over the place, but thank you. Yeah. Uh, Senator Aidan or Aidan? <clears throat> Thanks very much, and you're all very welcome here. It's, it's uh, a wonderful occasion. Some of you mentioned that it was historic, and I think it really is. And um, I want to thank Colette Callagher and the Civil Engagement Group for, for organising uh, for organising this and being to, uh, so uh, so persistent in pursuing the um, uh, the rights of of, of the travelling community and and, and travellers in, in this house um, since uh, for the last three years uh, the, that I've been here. Um, a few. You've mentioned a lot political representation in these houses, and uh, I think it's something that we want to support, having a designated Shannon seat uh, for the travelling community, I think would be an absolutely uh, excellent uh, idea, and we've mentioned it before in many different fora. H has it been examined as to how that would come into place? Does it require uh, overhauling of the entire Shannon electoral system? Does it require a constitutional amendment? Because it is a it's a feature of the Constitution, it's a constitutional house, or is it something that could be done much, much simpler? Um, I prefer something that was written in stone rather than at the, at the whim of a Taoiseach, that, because I can change Taoiseach to Taoiseach, if you like. Uh, the second question I have is about um, uh, hate speech legislation. Uh, and we have struggled for a long time in getting around to, um, to strengthening our hate, hate speech laws, because there is a strong lobby that uh, promotes the idea of free, of free speech, and that's understandable. Uh, but those who are at the rough end of hate speech are very vulnerable groups. Uh, and your community will be at the rough end of hate speech. There are journalists who can write things that are in any other country they wouldn't get away with, um, but they can write them in this country because of our, our hate speech laws. Uh, and there are political parties and, and political representatives within political parties who have said things that in any other country in the world would have, been, would have ended up in court. Um, so. I want to ask those two specific things. One, about the, the mechanisms about how we can uh, enshrine that Shannon seat uh, for the travelling community as a, as, a, as a permanent seat in the House of the Rockets. But secondly, your views uh, on hate speech legislation and how we can uh, turn the tide on, on the racist views that are, um, that are given out uh, without check about many different uh, communities in, in, in Irish society, but particularly uh, the travelling community. But again, uh, the last thing I'll say is that of all the communities that I, I've worked with, and I'm sure my, my colleagues have, work, have worked with, um, the travelling community come back and back and back again to, to the table. They always come back to the table with solutions and with positivity, when often it would be an awful lot easier to walk away from the table and to believe that nobody will ever, ever listen, will ever, ever listen. So to that, I congratulate you, uh, and, and you, I'm Senator. humbled by your, pre by your presence and by your presentations today. Thank you, Senator. We'll take one more for, for, for Francis. Uh, Senator John Dolan. From August, Lasca Hirlock, and um, I'm very happy to be here and be able to speak on this um, this have morning. You done, have you done, uh, My thanks briefly to to Senator Colette Kelleher um, for all the work she has done on this issue since the day she came into this house. Um, I want to particularly welcome someone that spent an afternoon in this chamber in June 2003. That's yourself, Rosalind, if you remember when both of us made presentations to the review, I think it was the number 11th review of the Shannon, or maybe it was the 12th or 15th, but anyway. Um, absolutely, we see, the, we see the results from it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But that's just to make the point that there has been an ongoing uh, um, um, wish yeah. to actually be able to play a stronger part in, 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 in the House of the Oireachtas. The Cahirlik is encouraging me. I'm, I'm I'm going, I've loads of things I'm, I'm I'd love to very say, of and the, the clock is bearing down. I want to get to these okay. people to have I, a few what answers. What I do is, I'm, I'm just going to posit uh, a couple of observations, and let there be questions out of that. Between contributions made by two people in particular, Minnie Connors and John Lonergan. Minnie, first of all, 
I must remember your sister and, we and thank you for actually sharing that. We talk about suicide, but it's different when you talk about a person and their life and their relationship. Uh, and that is a, a, a horrendous uh, issue. Um, I thought you captured the real day-to-day -day grind, education, housing, how over 40 years, uh, hard to see change. Um, the, the health issues and whatever. And that I found the most compelling and grounded uh, across a range of, of, of presentations today. Um, John Lonergan, I thought you was, I thought John was tempting us to look at this issue in a way that maybe we haven't and to look at some aspects of it that haven't been given uh, enough consideration. And <coughs> Senator, when we'll have the report, I'm sure we'll have a debate. The, uh, forgive me. It's this, the clock. Uh, <laughs> questions. <laughs> Question and answer. Actually, believe it or not, I was getting... Not second stage speeches, <laughs> okay? Oh, speaking of which, and, um, but the, the... Many contributors today rightly made reference to different participation channels. But I thought what Minnie and John were getting at, or was helping me to understand more, how do we actually take an historic occasion like this, and this is my question, and actually make something of it? What's the game changer? Uh, we both, if you like, if you want to look at it as the settled community in Travers, have a problem here. That a lot of, uh, and I'm not saying there shouldn't be more um, processes and whatever, that they have not on their own shifted the actual lived experience of people. So I'm asking, what is it to do with trust? Is it to leave aside how we victimize, or it's their fault, and we're the victims, or they're the victims, and we're, and all the rest of it? Something like this, I feel, has to happen. And the core of that, I think, is can we chance trusting each other with oh. some things? Goromahogut, and I thank you most sincerely, Oscar Hero. Again, look, I'm very grateful. Everything everybody is saying is very important. This must be brief to the point, questions. And Senator Martin. I, ha I have to go, uh, but I okay. was very keen just to commend the, the contributors, and particularly uh, Minnie. And, you know, this is a, we public, all commend them. This is a public session, and uh, I'm sure the people in Wexford, when it does hit the airwaves, as I've no doubt it will, will hold their heads in shame, because I think we need to look at laws where, when that type of thing does happen, uh, that these people can be brought uh, to account. So I suppose that is uh, the, the first point I wanted to make in terms of a question, uh, 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 look. And, and secondly, and I think this is a point as well, and I've experienced this myself, um, people who do uh, uh, try uh, uh, and assist uh, members of the travelling community end up getting, I suppose, harassed and harangued for doing so as well. I remember back in 2006, I think it was, I had a house uh, which I was very happy to rent to uh, uh, members of the travelling community who subsequently lived there for 10 years uh, very happily and there was no issue high up or low down as I knew there wouldn't be. Uh, but the amount of harassment uh, that I received uh, as a result of making the house uh, available to members of the travelling community was outrageous. And that gave me a very, very clear example of what members of the travelling community must suffer on a daily basis in terms of prejudice, harassment, um, uh, and dealing with a society that clearly uh, uh, hasn't uh, uh, lived up to its duties you, and Senator. responsibilities. And what I'd finally say uh, is, you know, well done for being here and people like Minnie. That's how you make the difference, because if you keep grinding away, eventually you will get a result. And we are here to help. Thank Come you. Out. Senator Lynn Ryan. Stay seated if that's all right, since we're not in usual Which? business. I'll stay seated if that's okay. Thanks. Of course. Yeah. Thank you, um, I have three, three questions. Um, Bernard, you said something that really stood out to me around collusion, and I straight away zoned in on that. And I think um, I'd love for you to expand a bit more on that, because I know as a working class woman, I have felt, I, am I colluding? Am I actually becoming part of a system? Am I, is, this, is this all worth it? So I'd love for you to expand a little bit more on that, because I think it is very interesting. So, because if we don't see outcomes and we don't see change, is it actually collusion? Is it 
box ticking, isn't it luck we spoke to travellers and been able to point to these occasions that happen from time to time without ever seeing any real outcome or change in the equality of our conditions? Um, Patrick, um, thanks very much for, for your presentation. And I, I think I'm right in saying that you've done law for your, your primary degree, was it? History and economics, was it? Um, yeah, like I remember first meeting you, maybe when you were in second year or third year, it might have been an event that we were doing. I'd love for you to expand a bit more on the, sco the financial scholarship idea. Would that be institution, the educational institutions, or would that be like a national kind of support system so that it's something that's run out nationally? Um, also, in relation to education, I think. Um, you know, over the next few years, you will be heralded as, look, um, look what Patrick has done. He has a PhD. Why aren't the rest of you getting that, right? That happens all the time. The person is held up as a weapon against their own community. And I think how important is it to keep battling back against that? Because we can keep saying that education is the way out, but actually we make it impossible for people to engage in education. So we can say education all we want to minority groups, but that puts a personal responsibility on the person to just engage and get their education instead of actually acknowledging right back to the, the years of assimilation and oppression that actually stop us even getting to the point where we even consider education. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit how we get a little bit down further in terms of supporting people at the very basic community level before they can even begin to engage in, in an educational process. And the third, um, I think maybe, uh, maybe Martin, you can speak to it, about political representation. Um, I think it's obviously hugely important. I, I, I'm completely for positive discrimination when it comes to, so we can have gender quotas all we want, but if that 50-50% is made up of all affluent to middle class people, that 50-50 doesn't actually, actually matter whether it's men or women. And it's about what the representation is actually made up of. And in the last local elections, what really stood out to me was the amount of women that were put on posters by parties but then not support. And I'm wondering, how can we ensure that if we move towards a place where we're encouraging, we're telling travellers they need to put themselves forward, but then we're not meeting with anything on the other side. And that fear, I suppose, of it becoming tokenistic in terms of travellers putting their names up on, on, on lampposts and posters, but actually then party structures and political structures still keeping every single support away from the travellers being able to actually have the support on a community network to actually be elected in the first place. So I think it's one, it's one thing putting women or travellers or working class people uh, out there for election, but if they're not actually met with the systems and structures to able to actually help them to get elected the way other people come together to get their friends elected. Like, I mean, there's a lot of mediocre people in here, but to be a working class person or a traveller cla traveller person, it's like you have to be exceptional. You have to prove yourself before you're even considered. And I'm just wondering how can we move past that and acknowledge that actually a lot of people in here are just pretty average, really. Uh, there's nothing exceptional about any of us. And that there's so many people within the travelling community that are expected to do the most amazing things before they're even considered to be put on a ballot. Thank you, Senator, for your questions. And finally, a question from Senator Joe O'Reilly. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. And it will be important to show no displays of mediocrity after that. <laughs> but uh, so we'll try to. Uh, to avoid that, no, well, thank you, thank you for that endorsement. Uh, no, Chair, first of all, to say to, um, to our visitors, our traveller people who are with us today, you are very, very welcome. It is, as my colleague Aon said earlier, historic. It's wonderful that you're here. It's also wonderful that it's a public session. And I just want to warmly welcome you and endorse it and hope it's part of an ongoing dialogue. I commend my colleague Colette Kelleher. I had the privilege of serving on the Council of Europe with Colette, Senator Colette Kelleher for some time, and I have a first-hand knowledge of how proactive she is on issues and how really committed and sincere she is. And this is a wonderful initiative of Senator Kelleher, and I commend that. Uh, I, I would say at the outset, and I think we all have to say to you at the outset, and I'm coming to a sequence of questions then. Uh, I, I we don't have all day, outset, unfortunately. Uh, I anticipated your interruption. I have to come back to look. these good people so for I'd brief closing comments. That, uh, we, you are the victims of prejudice and ignorance uh, on the part of our community, and I think we should begin by admitting that and that there is a lot wrong at our end, and I think it's an important starting point. And there's no point in dividing that or dressing, up it, dressing it up in any other forum. And we have a, a known as, as community leaders to try to 
less than that. I served on the Traveller Accommodation Committee of my county council and worked to do that, and I taught a traveller class. But I, I do think that we have a duty. And I'm not, we we're not all doing enough. I'm not doing enough myself, but we have a duty to break down those prejudices. Now, a couple Put of things to question. raise with you. I missed your contributions because I was travelling up from Cavan and unavoidably so. But uh, I'd like to again ask about the suicide issue. I mean, I, I heard, I gather from the questions that there was a very human personal testimony there. It's, it's a very real issue. It's a, an issue in all communities, but I gather it's a very special one with you, tragically. Um, I personally think, and I, by way, I would say to you, the great empowerment and the great key to, if you like, emancipation, empowerment, self-development, power and strength in your communities is knowledge, is education. Therein lies the key. Sorry, I, sir, I'm coming to, the to I do understand that you have a problem with, I understand you have a problem with bullying in secondary schools, but I'd like to ask you about the transition to secondary. How do you think that's evolving? And I think I felt as I left teaching that the stage where I was leaving, there was a movement into secondary education of a greater degree. And I know there's bullying there and there are also some barriers, but I'd like to ask you about that. I'd also like to ask you, how do you deal with your minorities within the traveller community? How are you, how do you think you're performing in relation to LGBT rights, in relation to people, persons with disability, in relation to minorities? Because I always, and relation, I always felt, and I must say this with the greatest respect, that there was a level of hierarchical thing in your community too, which sometimes can be very damaging to weaker people. So how do you deal with that? That's in all our societies and wrong, but I'd be interested in how you deal with the challenges facing you there too. So basically, in Thank summation, you. it's great that you're here. I hope there's more days to come like this. And I don't think we're doing enough. I think we have to say publicly we're not. And we, you challenge us to do more. Well, thank, and today, challenges us to do more. Thanks better. to our own rapporteur, Senator Collett. We're going to have a brilliant report, I've no doubt. There will be, that will be going to government. And there will be debate. I'm sure the leader will facilitate the debate. Obviously, he will on that. Now, I'm coming over to your good selves now. You've heard the questions. If you could find them in all of that. And I'd like to, in your brief, in your brief summing up, uh, you deal with anything you, you've heard. And I'll start with you, Mark. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Chair. Uh, just for, uh, before I respond to some of the questions, uh, it would be remiss of me if I didn't acknowledge uh, a number of people here today who have been really great champions of, of travel rights o over the years, and that would be Lynn, obviously, and Colette and Aon over there, who have been you know, very consistent in their support in advocating for travel rights. And just to say, it's really, really appreciated. We need that support uh, because we can't take this journey or take this challenge on our own. And it would be great if a lot more politicians showed some leadership and, and, and began to support and advocate for traveller and Roman human rights. I, I would say, look, at, we're beyond the point of uh, having to prove or provide more evidence that travellers continue to suffer oppression, exclusion and racism. We're really beyond that point. There's, in, there's independent evidence from the Human Rights Commission, from the ESRI and from in, internationally recognised uh, human rights uh, bodies. Uh, John was asking earlier on, what's the core issue? Or what's the big issue? Is it a lack of trust? Or, or what? Before we actually can begin to resolve the issues, there has to be an acknowledgement and there has to be an agreement and a consensus on what the core issue is, what the core problem is. And the core problem here is, and this is where we need leadership, it has to be named, the core problem is racism. Racism, without a shadow of a doubt. Racism at both the individual level and the institutional level. And sometimes our political establishment is actually complicit in perpetuating that racism. And we see the manifestations of that racism. Uh, many and others spoke about suicide. That's a manifestation of the racism. The poor living conditions is a manifestation of the racism. The low educational attainment, high unemployment rate, these are all manifestations of the individualised and institutional racism. So if we're serious about addressing and, uh, these issues and supporting the inclusion of travellers and respecting the human rights of travellers, let's name it for what it is and stop pussyfooting around. That's one issue I would say. The, 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 in relation to Aidan, um, in relation to the uh, seat, let's be realistic. 
it's a good symbolic starting point if there's a traveller in the Shannon, you know, nominated by the Taoiseach or by some other means. But that on its own will not be a panacea. That, you know, it's a good starting point. It's not going to be a panacea. It won't re resolve all the issues. We still need a so-called participative democracy, you know, the national and local consultative committees dealing with health, education uh, and so forth. Uh, so let's be, reali re be realistic about that because when traveller ethnicity was acknowledged on the 1st of March 2017, somehow or another a, a very unrealistic expectation was created in the community that suddenly the, the, the symbolic recognition of traveller ethnicity will resolve all of the issues that we're facing. That hasn't happened happened and it's not going to happen. In fact, the travellers are feeling very let down and very disillusioned as a result because the recognition hasn't really translated into rights on the ground for travellers. But in relation to the Shannon seats, I certainly would agree with you, Aidan, rather than leaving to the whim of the Taoiseach of the day, I think if that could be copper fastened from a legislative point of view, uh, whereby it's, it's guaranteed on an ongoing basis, I, I certainly would uh, favour uh, that option. And, and certainly what you do want for travellers who are, taking, uh, who are participating in the political system, you, you don't want tokenism. That's absolutely not something that you want. So the proper and appropriate support systems and structures need to be in place to ensure that whoever the travellers are who are, who are participating either in the Shannon or the Dáil are, are, are participating in a meaningful uh, and indeed in, 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 in a significant way. And lastly, in relation to the LGBTI, uh, uh, of course there are challenges and there are issues in our community and we, we will be the first to say it in terms of you know, um, um, feuding, issues around children's rights, LGBT issues. And to be fair, travel organisations have gained the maturity and the confidence and the skill set to be able to look at these issues and try and deal with them. I know Chris is here from the National Travel Mediation Service and he'll be speaking later on about some of these, about some of these issues. But just to give you an example of some of the progress we have made, one day a few weeks ago we had at least 50 travellers and non-travellers who are working with travellers taking part in Dublin Pride. 10, 15 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. That's just an indication. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's by any means resolved. We have a long way, uh, long journey ahead of us. Thank you, Martin. Can I have a brief comment and uh, answer to any of the questions there from you, Patrick? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, in regards to your first question, then, uh, regarding should it be a national scholarship or an institution, why, of course, it would be look great if each, every university did offer one? I think it would work best if it was a national scholarship. I don't think it should matter that I went to Trinity or if I went to UCC or NUIG or Minuf or Limerick. It, that should, I think that's actually, I think, completely wrong approach, where it should be a national programme that travellers college can apply to. And then, of course, that might cover fees and offer maintenance. In regards to your second question, in regards to, obviously, I mean, it's quite a good point, actually. When I do finish, even, even right now, it's quite easy for me to be put on a pedestal and to be used as a stick to beat others, or to be quite simply in something I am quite aware of, even just my, my own tokenism. If, if I'll probably, all going well, probably be the first traveller for PhD from Trinity, and that'll probably be quite tokenistic for quite a long time. And I think the big step in terms of primary and sort of secondary education is. I've been quite fortunate in my circumstances in a way that perhaps others have not been. I've never had a teacher at primary or secondary level never tell me I couldn't do anything, that this wasn't for me. And I think the main issue is, of course, and of course, what Minnie said about her, about her you know, children being sort of, you know, reduced hours, I never had reduced hours. And that also can make a huge difference. In primary school, I was taken out for an hour a day for separately. Which, which in hindsight was part because of my own background rather than actual need. And I think in some ways the big issue is it comes to teachers themselves and how, it's, how are travellers treated in the classroom from a young age. If they feel bullied, if, they think, if they're told they're different, they're, not, they're going to be less likely to continue. And I think there needs to be an encouragement that education does not need to mean university education. I know I'm, I myself have pursued university education, but that education can mean it can be apprenticeships, it can be other careers. It should, obviously, people should be encouraged to complete the primary and secondary education. But the, the, end all, the end all everything should not necessarily be a university education. There are other career paths that require an education. I think, and this is obviously an issue that, is, that doesn't just apply to travellers, it applies to the population in general. Education does not purely mean university. It's, it's, quite, for, it's quite variety, whether it's an apprenticeship or university or other forms. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen. Thank you. Um, 
I'm going to just uh, maybe reply on, um, on three separate questions, if I can. Uh, the, the first one would be around mental health, because I was asked a specific question on that. Um, the expert here on travel mental health is Thomas McCann, who's going to be talking in the afternoon. Um, he, he so works. It's supposed to be started like yeah, five yeah, minutes ago. Yeah, but, but, I don't know what I'm going to do. I had second stage speeches over here. I've asked everybody to be as brief as possible, and it's your right now to respond to the questions. And, I, I, and again, I'm going to try and keep this very, very, very brief. Do yeah, that would be appreciated. To, to understand, to, to look at mental health or suicide and just take it in, as, a, as a separate issue, we're never going to get anywhere with that. Suicide is... Um, is a result of underlying issues. Now, for, we can't turn around and say that every suicide is caused because of the same things, because there's lots of different reasons for it. But there's no doubt about it, and we can take uh, out of the equation um, the, uh, the discrimination, the racism, um, the exclusion, the lack of unemployment opportunities and the lack of education and attainment that our community has, has received. So we can't t t look at it in isolation. It's, all, it's a symptom of a much, much bigger problem, and we have to address the bigger problem, and the, the bigger problem is exclusion and discrimination against, uh, against the travel community. I just got an opportunity. Sorry. I was late coming up, but I'm just here to <coughs> welcome you. Sorry, Senator, I'm just welcome you to the meeting. Senator, please. And I agree with Senator. Please, this Senator, means so Senator, much what you said. Senator, please, and please respect the chair. We've had questions. It's now up to all of these good you, people. Who so you're telling me I am being silenced as a member not, of this you're house? Not, you're not. You have time. But hold on. Hold, hold the contributions, hold on, and now you're coming in and interrupting their responses. Yeah, well then stay quiet till the next session. Then. This session starts at 10 o'clock. I want to be here. Yeah, that's all. I Senator. Thank Senator, thank you. Senator, please not be disorderly. Look, I'm trying to conduct very, this yeah, thing sensibly. Awesome. Sorry, yeah, and forgive that interruption. Sorry, 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 sorry Kathleen. No, that, Kathleen is answering that's questions. That's sorry, that's Senator. That's this is a public that's consultation. That's Senator, please, please. To come back Kathleen. to how do we address it? How do we, 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 we address it? We have to start looking at how do we address We need to be dealing with travel children getting meaningful education. We're continuing seeing traveller children coming out of school who can barely read and write. Um, so that needs to be addressed, and we need to be understanding of why that is. You know, there's been a lot of discussion recently around the reduced timetables. Um, but again, that needs to be addressed. You know, if we want people to be able to access, we're, we're one of the most developed countries in, in, the, in the world. People are coming from around the world to come here for, to have, create, have, have better opportunities. Yet we have 84% unemployment within our community. We also have, it's not just a travel community, there's working class areas that have high levels of uh, unemployment as well. There's people who are getting left behind. So we need to be addressing making sure that we have positive discrimination around employment. But we also need to be assessing children so that they are getting proper education, that they can attain that. So, so, so that's, part, that's part of it. To look to the question we were asked around, we say uh, travellers' representation around a, a Senate seat. Um, we, we wouldn't, you know, we want a tr tr in, the, in the long term, and when I say in the long term, in the, over the next year, to, uh, year or so, we would hope that we would be able to work towards within the national organisations and the local travel groups to build a travel constituency where every traveller will have the right to vote for a traveller who is representing them in so if, the, you know, with the help of God, we're going to be getting uh, a Senate seat. And if we are, we'll put forward a number of travellers, or travellers can put themselves forward, but the travel community will vote on, uh, on that. Um, but we don't want it simply to be looking at one Senate seat. We need to be having travellers represented where the political decisions are being made, and that's on local and government and national government. I'm going to come back to a point that I made earlier. There is, without a doubt, there is no community in Ireland who has ever been as negatively affected by, uh, by political decisions and political indecisions as what the traveller community has. We need positive discrimination. We need to see seats that are dedicated and allocated for travellers um, within that. But we also need to be providing training. One of the things that Minka Whitten did is that around the conference as well, we put together videos of educating travellers on 
why you should uh, register to vote, how you get registered to vote, and how you cast your vote. We have to look for where people are at. And people who are being excluded from the political system or haven't been part of the political system, they don't understand the mechanics of it. So we need to be start looking at it where, where, where they're at. And I hope that answers the question. Over to you, uh, Bernard. John. John. Oh, sorry, forgive me. John. John. Um, my, my very, very, uh, yeah, very, very briefly, I am. Um, I'll then, Bernard. I, I, very, very if briefly, you can pick up on any questions there, John, and answer them briefly, yeah, I appreciate very, it. Very, very briefly, I, I think, you know, in terms of education, I'm a great believer in, in the broader sense, and I totally agree with Patrick in relation to education. But if we are not getting primary education right, uh, and if the experience that has been expressed here this morning is, 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 why, is more widespread than an individual case, and I believe it is, well, then that, for me, is where it all begins and ends. Because the, the child's experience of education must be a positive one. And if, unless that is the case, well, then education is, and, uh, is, is going to suffer. So I'm a great believer in that. It must be a happy experience. It must be an inclusive experience. And we must uh, and, uh, you know, put the emphasis on that. Where the child starts off in primary education, that is where it all begins. And if that's a good experience, everything, and I totally agree with you, Patrick, in relation to you know, this idea that uh, it has to be third level. It does not. Uh, education is a way broader than that, and, and it's way more significant than that. And for young children, it must be that it's a normal thing to do, like everybody else. And there is a connection between extreme poverty and education. And that's where I highlighted in Mount Jai many years ago. The poorer your co area you come from, the less opportunity you have in education. That is a fundamental uh, discrimination, and it's not exclusively for travellers, but they are a big sufferer. Of. Thank you very much. Bernard, as brief as you. you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kerr um, Just in terms of the um, commentary and uh, just around the diversity and equality within the traveller community, I would say, yeah, we have obviously come so far, but uh, we still have a long way still to go. Um, but at the same time, I think the traveller community have to led the way in terms of human rights, equality, participation and inclusion. And I think the wider community have a lot to learn from the traveller community in terms of progressing and going forward. Um, in terms of Lynn. Luan's question just around the occlusion, um, I think that's an important question, Lynn. Um, in terms of participation, where do you stop in terms of outcomes? So people, the travel community and travel activists have been engaging in you know, all these different structures and, be, and have been asked to engage. But the big question then is, in, in terms of the implementation of policies, um, and that policy is in terms of task force report um, in 1995, and all the recommendations that came out of that, we haven't seen all the recommendations from that being applied. So that's what I mean by in terms of you know, participation and inclusion in terms of outcomes. There has been poor outcomes for the, the amount of time and resources that we've put into it. But I think in terms of we are, there is pro progress, but I think we need to see a lot more progress in terms of real change in terms of outcomes, because it's not acceptable in terms of suicide, it's not acceptable in terms of housing crisis, it's not acceptable in terms of people, you know, in terms of racism and exclusion. So all of those issues are at a crisis point for the community. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my contribution. Thank you very much. Have you anything briefly for the thread, Joanna? Yeah. Um, I'd just like to say uh, there's just two parts. Um, in regards to the underspend of the travel accommodation budget, I do agree that there needs to be consequences and accountability there, but it shouldn't be that, uh, at the detriment of the traveller community. It, should, it, it shouldn't be taken from one or local authority and brought to another. It should be spent in the, in the actual authority, local authority that it's being given to. But what should happen is the accountability and consequences should not be to the traveller community, but to the authorities who are refusing to spend it on the much needed traveller culturally appropriate accommodation. The local authorities should be held to account, there should be consequences to them. It should not be spread around and it definitely should not be given back because we have all seen the consequences that come from that. And as far as the hate speech legislation, we as travellers, I know myself and I'm no, I wouldn't be alone in saying this, have experienced um, hate speech in a way that would not be acceptable to other people in this, uh, this country, let alone in other parts of the world. Um, 
And my own, my own view on that would be that there needs to be um, a code of conduct put in place. There needs, people need to be le led by example from the government, from the local authorities and that, and there needs to be um, a code of conduct put in place, but there also the development of the national anti-racism strategy um, would definitely be essential to addressing that. And we definitely need to develop and enact the hate, um, the hate crime legislation where travellers are named, like I said earlier. So. Thank you. Rachel and Anne, have you a brief point? No, thank you. answer? We're happy to concede to traveller colleagues. Sorry, Anne? We're happy to concede to traveller colleagues in responses. You're happy to? Concede to all Yes, of course. Colleagues. And anyway, anything that's overlooked here, I'm sure can be taken up in the dialogue on traveller social inclusion when we get to that. So next is um, Kevin, yeah. Have you a brief point? Yeah, just anything? very briefly that... Um, on the matter around uh, collusion, um, I'd just like to say that the only way past that is for uh, members of the travel community to be in positions to be working alongside the majority counterparts. Because the more experience that people have of working alongside people from the travel community, the more they'll recognise that the contribution they have, the knowledge and skills that they have, and that immediately breaks down those negative stereotypes. So getting travel people into those positions, that's how we stop that from happening. So Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Minnie, you've got a few questions. Yeah. Couldn't get them all at one time. Um, um, I think I'll talk about the schools, for the children in schools. Um, as a mother of five, um, my oldest daughter, she's 18, and then the youngest is, is uh, 10 in September. Um, they got the very same schooling as I got. Very same. No difference. In the same school, same. They were treated the same. They got the very same thing. The way I was treated, I looked at my children being treated in the school. I suppose to give you a, a better sense of a challenged child, the way you can imagine how a challenged child being four year old without ever going to school, right? And they thinking that they're so proud of who they are, they're so proud of their mommy and daddy, their brothers and sisters, they're so proud of all their horses, their dogs, they're proud of that. Then they're so excited to go off to school, their first day in school their new uniform on them, their school bag on their back, and they're heading off for their first day in school. The very first day that child will arrive at that door to school, that child is given a special needs teacher. That child is treated different by the teacher. Then the other classmates will say, my teacher is treating you different, so you're different. So you're different now in baby infants, and you will be different up until sixth class, so you're going nowhere in your life. So all the ch challenge child wants to do then is fight to get out of school fight to get out of school any way they can. My children sit in their class before they go out to play. They choose to sit in the class because they, don't, they have no friends. Born and reared in Wexford, born and reared and went to the same school as their mummy went to. And their children have no, con they have no um, connection at all in the school, across nothing. Um, I think if, if we were to try and do something, it would have to be, we'd have to have travellers and, in, in the schools. But I think a small step would be having teachers getting culturally appropriate training around travelling children and around travellers and, and just be kind to them, like, let them know that they are human that they, and let them know that it's not going to be a waste of their time if they, tr if they teach the child like all the other children in school. So. Thanks, Minnie. You're, you're okay. Thank you very much. Now, on behalf of the Shannon Public Consultation Committee, I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, for your presentations here today. It's been both informative and productive, I believe. A good session, and I think we all learned from your insights and observations. Full account will be taken of all today's discussions when a draft report has been prepared by Colette, and copies of the final, final report will be sent to all contributors. Now, I would propose that we suspend with Deal with Traveller dialogue and social inclusion starting at half past twelve if that's agreeable, and I would ask the Leader of the House, Senator Jerry Buttermore, if he would, move the suspension until... I'd move, okay. so that move. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you.
behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome all of the following witnesses to this our second session on dialogue and traveller social inclusion. Mr. Chris McDonough, Traveller Mediation Service, Mr. Dennis Robinson, Doctoral Candidate, at University College Cork, Ms. Lynn Scariff, National Museum of Ireland, Ms. Rosa Meehan, National Museum of Ireland, Ms. Maria Joyce, Coordinator, National Travellers Women's Forum, Mr. Owen T. Vardoin, excuse me, Neilan Neilan Gelga Gufrosha Gugum, National Action Group for LGBT and Traveller and Roma Rights. Dr. Carl Kitching, Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, UCC. Ms. Rose Marie Mohan, Hearing Autistic Traveller Voices. Mr. Thomas McCann, Traveller Counseling Service. Ms. Bridget Carmody, Coordinator, Cork Traveller Women's Network. Ms. Louise Harrington, Community Development Worker, Cork Traveller Women's Network. And Ms. Elish Barry, Chief Executive, Free Legal Advice Centres, FLAC. We are all most welcome and I thank you for engaging with the committee in its consideration of this most important topic. Um, I'll get over my sheet. Uh, before we begin, I must draw your attention to the following procedural matters. Uh, number one, the fact that by virtue of section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the Chair to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. Uh, you are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to do, respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her it identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any opening statements you have made to the committee will be published on the committee website after this meeting. To commence proceedings, I will invite Senator Colette Keller, our coordinator, more importantly than that, our rapporteur, and to whom we are most grateful we wouldn't have this subject matter before us. Um, um, Colette will make a few introductory remarks at the beginning of this session. I will then invite each witness to make a short presentation to the committee. You may share your time with a colleague if you so wish, and please indicate this to me when you are invited to speak. When the presentations are finished, there will be time, I hope, for questions and comments from the senators and responses from the witnesses. I'm conscious of the fact that uh, this chamber will be going into the Senate uh, later on. Anyway. Now, we're, we're ready to go with Senator Collette. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Cahir. Look, and I suppose one thing to say is there'll be a cup of tea at 2.30 uh, for everybody. So, uh, and far, much. probably more yeah. important than anything else I'm going to say today. Um, but returning to Enda Kenny's words on the 1st of March 2017, when the state formally recognised the ethnicity of Irish travellers, he said, I hope that today we will create a new platform for positive engagement by the traveller community and government together seeking sustainable solutions based on respect and honest dialogue. For too long, travellers' identity was not recognised. The Itinerancy Commission's 1963 report, the damage it did, the damage of which we are only beginning to undo. That report socially constructed travellers as failed settle people, denying the reality of people's true and proud identity. This was the obliteration of people's true essence and very presence from the public sphere. What happened as a result was very, very wrong, personally for people and also politically. Travellers are still living with the consequence in so many ways that we heard earlier today. It was bad for travellers and by extension, bad for Ireland. Today, we will examine ways to foster inclusion, dialogue and relationships between travellers and the wider community. We will hear directly about and name the very real stigma, prejudice, discrimin discrimination and racism. And I think Martin got that, Martin. Racism is at the, the heart of all of this, uh, at the heart of everything. And that's what we need to face up to and understand. And then, because of it, social exclusion and the identity erosion, which is shamefully and sadly an everyday reality for travellers. And again, Minnie Connors 
spoke very eloquently about that. Some people experiencing double discrimination by virtue of gender, by virtue of sexuality and disability, and Rosalie McDonough spoke eloquently again on that. Finally, we are discussing uh, this um, matter today in the area of fake news and uh, the critical importance of accurate and fair treatment of travellers in the media. The recent coverage of a certain presidential candidate, and I won't dignify it by giving a name here, did not reflect well on our media. The kind of discourse, this kind of discourse generates, generates hate speech and hate crime. We need good and effective law to deal with this. We must also understand the impact of hate speech on people's participation in the world. The K-word it's, and its harmful and hurtful effects is particularly odious in terms of internalised oppression and mental ill health. There is not a traveller family in Ireland that has not been affected by suicide. The statistics are truly shocking and far-reaching, with traveller men seven times more likely to take their own lives and traveller women six times more than the general population. And we heard about that very eloquently and at first hand this morning. The media has a responsibility in propagating stereotypes and bias. It was very encouraging that the Office of the Press Ombudsman made a submission to this public call. However, despite codes of ethics, travellers still experience unequal participation within the media, both in reporting, delivery and invisibility. The historical way in which travellers were and are still often presented in the media is most likely where they are subjects of news rather than being visible throughout mainstream broadcast materials or be commentators or, presented, or presenters influencing the narrative. So we need to move beyond our segregated worlds and look at ways to foster inclusion and dialogue. We can collaborate nationally and locally. We need to get it right. We need to, we need to create spaces like this and we have one here today. So we are now going to hear more voices to continue our conversations and our deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, Colette. And now, uh, first speaker will be Chris McDonough of the Traveller Mediation Service. Chris, when are we ready? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair and Senators, thanks very much for inviting me here today to speak. Uh, as I said, my name is Chris McDonough. I'm from the TMS, the Traveller Mediation Service, and I have been working as a mediator for five years now. The Traveller Mediation Service is a partnership initiative supported by the Resources of Justice in the community, RJC and are funded by the Department of Justice and Equality. TMS is based in Athlone, County Westmead. We have four mediators at the moment working. TMS, originally called MTCMI, the Midlands Traveller Conflict Mediation Initiative, started in 2009 as a response to conflicts in the Midlands. We in TMS work to assist our clients and stakeholders to find ways to prevent, manage and transform conflicts peacefully and effectively. There are two main strands to the work of the Traveller Mediation Service, which broadly can be divided into conflict intervention and conflict prevention work. On the conflict intervention side, the mediation, we mediate <coughs> excuse me, conflicts between travellers, travellers and agencies, and between travellers and the wider community. TMS accepts mediation cases and referrals from the travellers communities and agencies nationally. We have seen over the last three years a substantial increase in the percentage of referrals coming directly from the travel community. At this stage it's over 90% of referrals. Previously the majority of the referrals were from the Gardaí and Urdu agencies. On the conflict prevention side of the work we run a number of conflict skills workshops and mediation programs. TMS has been running peer mediation training programs for prisoners in Castlery, Cork, Lachlan House and Dorcas since early 2017. TMS recently been asked to deliver their peer mediation program in the Midlands Prison this autumn. The peer mediation training is for prisoners to learn skills to defuse conflicts on their landings, but it's also to build relationships between the travellers community and the wider community in the prisons and the staff. TMS also delivers intercultural awareness workshops with trainee prisoners officers to talk about the culture of travellers for these uh, prisoners that will, the majority of working there. Proving young people with conflict resolution skills in new reach centres and with tra traveller youth groups. Workshops for staff and travellers in traveller projects 
nationwide. There are a number of factors to consider when looking at how to develop and foster positive and productive working relationships between traveller communities, travellers and the Gardaí and travellers and local communities. The relationship between travellers and the settled communities in Ireland today is complex. This is influenced by a number of factors including the lack of contact and knowledge on the part of each community about each other. It is imperative that both communities play a role in fostering understanding, consideration and respect for each other's culture. Increased levels of contact, both formal and informal, must be recognised in particularly at local level. Local authorities and other local stakeholders also have a vital role in playing, to play in building relationships. The post-ethnic recognition of travellers by the Irish state, we need to build a new relationship between the majority community and the traveller community, one that is based on respect for the culture, identity and ethnic difference, a relationship based on inclusion, equality and opportunity for all regardless of the ethnic or cultural background. What we would like to see from TMS is building trust and real relationship between travellers, agencies and the wider community, often through key trusted members of the community who are bridge builders. For example, the local traveller projects, who are working with local county council and have developed relationships with local councillors and politicians. We would like to see more happen in more areas. Continue of Garda Traveller Dialogue Days and expansion of them around the country with the support of Garda and local travel projects. This year we ran a dialogue day in Minute University between, uh, between 10 and 12 travel mediators and 15 local Garda to look at the building relationships between the Garda and the local travellers. Also, we would, TMS would like to see a pilot and an area based agency, community settlement traveller dialogue with the aim to improve providing understanding and communication between all stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ed, Chris. And now we move to Dennis Robinson, doctoral candidate in University College Cork. Over thank you. you. Firstly, I want to thank uh, Senator Clett for encouraging me to make uh, this presentation today. Um, I want to, I'll be brief at this point, I just want to make a couple of points but not specific making reference to the submission that I've made already. I work in Rathkeel with a community that is 80% um, travelling community and 20% uh, mainstream or the settled community. So it's an unusual uh, dynamic compared to the rest of the country, I think, where the minority or a settled group and the majority of the community are of um, an ethnic minority group. These are some insights that I've just encountered or uh, are able to acknowledge in the last few months. Firstly, what struck me in the work there, that that engagement between the travelling community and state agencies is always a source of contention for people in the community people, uh, members of the travelling community are afraid that they lose benefits. They're afraid that, that there's always the sense that they're not believed. There's a sense that they're always starting on the back foot when applying for um, what's rightfully theirs in, in, in social benefits. I think there's a huge need for training of frontline staff to meet the needs, <coughs> the specific needs of uh, this community, of the travelling community. According to um, a predecessor of mine, David Breen, he talked about, he worked a lot with the advocacy work for the community. And when it came to um, accessing services or accessing social welfare benefits, he talked about people being automatically refused their benefits then it went to a review process where they were refused again and went to a third process, an independent appeals process, which was often the only success. So where people, other people who lived in the community applied for benefits, received benefits, were entitled to them, it was their right. Generally, members of the travelling community had to go, three, go 
through three levels before they were even heard. I suppose when we're working as a group in Rathkeel, the real questions that are standing out for us is that, and again I mentioned the dynamic of the community, it's like who has a say in that community, who always has a say in that community, and who rarely or never has a say in that community. Now, of all of the agencies and groups within the, the town of Rathkeel, there are no traveller representatives on any of the community groups. And that raises huge questions that we haven't even addressed fully. I mentioned again, and I keep referring, that 80 to 85 per cent of the community are our travelling community who own approximately 80 to 90 per cent of the property in, in the town. Um, and all decisions regarding the town are made independently of travellers, or generally against them. So you have a town that's a beautiful town, a, a country market town, that's predominantly owned by the community. And when it comes to structural decisions or making decisions about the town, they have no access or no voice. That's disturbing. Finally, a comment. There is some international <coughs> evidence and research in literature that talks about trauma and how it is carried by some ethnic groups across the world. And again, there's this sense of internalised rejection that I know, speaking with colleagues and friends in the community who talk about that, that they're carrying this sense, we will not be accepted, we will not be allowed in, we will not be, allowed, we will not be listened to. And again, that's a disturbing place to be. So I think the recognition of ethnicity does not eradicate the trauma that some travellers that I've met encounter and feel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Um, next on my list is Lynn Scarf, National Museum of Ireland. Thank Away you, Chair. Um, first of all, thank you to the Chair and to the Committee for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Lynn Scarf. I'm Director of the National Museum of Ireland and I'm joined today by my colleague Miss Rosa Meehan, one of our curators, who really has been the lead in all of the work that we've been doing with the traveller community within the National Museum. Just for some background, the National Museum of Ireland is Ireland's na largest national cultural institution with four public sites, um, one in Turlock Park in Castlebar in County Mayo. We collect, conserve and interpret the largest holdings of portable heritage, over four million artefacts, and welcome over, four, over one million visitors per annum. Um, there are currently 170 staff employed across all of our four sites. Following our recent submission, we're very honoured to be here today and share our experience and collaborative practice with the traveller community. I very much would wish to acknowledge the people in, this, in the Shannon Chamber today, many of whom we have been working with over the last number of years, and thank them for their contribution and work with us. So the National Museum of Ireland holds and interprets our national collection and it is a critical value of the museum that this collection is reflective of all of the people of Ireland and our shared experiences. It's also crucial that the individuals and communities are co-curators with the museum of that story and editors of their own narrative and experience. And it is with these values in mind and our role as a public institution that the museum is taking an increasingly socially engaged and intentionally collaborative approach to its work. Of particular focus is the manner in which it engages with communities that have been traditionally marginalised and underrepresented in our national cultural institutions. And while the museum views this work as very critical to our own values as an organisation, I think in the context of today it's important to note that the IHREC Act in 2014 emphasises our public sector duty to embed equality and human rights considerations in our policies and our programmes. While our museum is free to enter, the actual barriers to entry are many and sometimes invisible to those of us within the institution and it requires the building of long-term and trusted relationships where there is mutual understanding sought and forged and those relationships are nurtured to enable the addressing of these barriers. 
This community-led, co-curated and participative approach sees the museums and communities working together to identify objects that tell our national stories, and it very much values the expertise of the community in telling that story. In doing so, the museum's goal is very much to give a platform and power to the voices that have been marginalised or overlooked in our cultural spaces. And while the museum is never neutral, we are a safe and a non-partisan space that provides and can facilitate, crucially, prolonged dialogue about culture and identity. We want the museum to be a space where visitors can engage with and explore traveller material culture and ethnicity. And we know that there is no one definition of traveller culture, and we recognise the importance of the traveller community in framing its own stories. And the museum crucially wants to work in collaboration to enable visibility of an engaged conversation about traveller culture across place, space, time and generations by and with visitors to the museum. Our recent experience on making visible and exploring traveller culture has been based around the museum's temporary exhibition and associated programme, Traveller's Journey, Minkair Michelet. This involved a year-long exhibition opened by President Michael D. Higgins last July 2018 and a series of events and talks on aspects of traveller culture and identity, including the publication of This Giant Tent, a wonderful collaborative project with local schools and the traveller community and kids' own publishing, as well as local artists and writers. The camp project and panel discussions such as I Am Traveller, Our History and Heritage, many people in the room took part in that um, particular event. Our approach towards this project aimed at the heart to be inclusive and collaborative, to be respectful and to be authentic. And while expertly led by Rosa Meehan beside me, it has involved the National Museum of Ireland's board, our senior management team, our curators, education marketing teams, and crucially, our visitor security teams. We also engaged in museum-wide training on traveller culture, identity and awareness for all of our staff and all of our sites. And ultimately, as an institution, on reflection, the experiences of working in collaboration on this project have greatly expanded our knowledge, experience and changed our own practice. So for the purposes of today, we just have some key learnings and recommendations. First of all, reaching out. As a national cultural institution, it is critical that you reach out, support and participate in traveller events as a way of making and growing connections with the community. Partnerships are incredibly critical. We worked in partnership with the Western Regional Traveller Help Network and Traveller's Journey, but traveller community expertise is core. You have to work with representatives, and it's also important to provide pathways to those communities um, that may be not associated with those organisations, so open calls, events to engage, and a chance to develop networks. And we very much recognise that the traveller community as an ethnic group has a shared and connected history, but with many different expressions, and that there are challenges in consulting inc inclusively with the whole community, and it's important to work in partnership to achieve this. Consultation and partnership take resources for all involved, and it's important as a large cultural institution that sustained engagement can be challenging for a number of organisations, and there's a need for more dedicated resources and support. Um, in that. In working in partnership, discuss, discussion and the embedding of shared goals is essential and also the review and allocation of resources in partnership and collaboration are essential. Widening the audience. Museum public programmes are an integral part of our work and broader public programmes increase visibility and promote conversations beyond the already engaged. Our awareness of cultural appropriation and the sensitivity to the imbalance of power between our institutions and traditionally marginalised voices is important. And for this reason, every effort is made to ensure members of the traveller community lead our events about traveller culture, and no event will ever be held without their involvement. And it's not enough to say all are welcome. Particular initiatives are needed to encourage participation within the museum space and to address those invisible barriers that I spoke of earlier. Traveller specific events can give participants a sense of belonging within the museum and help to initiate the breakdown of those barriers. Widening the collaborators into the cultural community, bringing artists, poets, writers and seeking out collaborative creative projects. This is an important way of broadening the conversation and exploration of traveller culture in a meaningful way. And we engaged in a number of different projects with a range of traveller communities and age groups. Um, 
the inclusion of members of the traveller community on any curatorial selection panel for commissioned projects is also essential. And it's not just about having one person from the traveller community, but multiple people with different voices and different perspectives. We recommend that there's a specific fund for traveller culture creative projects in partnership with organisations like ourselves that can reach out and enable more traveller artists and communities to participate in artistically expressing traveller culture and identity and creative and other partnerships that foster links and build relationships. Our experience of creative projects such as the Giant Tent book, which is a project by children for children, created as part of the exhibition, demonstrated the importance of creating quality Irish produced material on traveller culture and identity. And finally, the museum also wants to support a diverse workforce and we do require expertise from the wider community to inform our strategic planning. And while collaboration provides an opportunity for lasting engagement, real change requires a diverse workforce in our cultural institutions. And we need to look at mechanisms to enable traditionally marginalised voices and people to join our teams. And we would value support from equality agencies to implement ideas around good practice in that space. Finally, to conclude, the National Museum of Ireland deeply values the relationships that has developed over the last number of, of years in these projects. And as we are now in the process of developing a new permanent exhibition on traveller culture and history in our Museum of Country Life, we want to grow these relationships further. We recognise that we are at the beginning of this journey. We aspire to be a museum that recognises and celebrates the diversity of a wide range of communities and eth ethnicities. But we note the root of all these programmes is trusted relationships between individuals and communities and that kind of relationship requires multi-annual long-term sustainable systems and resourcing that recognize the complexities of this process and enable the initiatives thank you thank you i, I gave you injury time there thank you I take it you're all advised about trying to keep things to five minutes Apologies, but we'll, we'll give you a bit of latitude if necessary so thank you and next now is maria Joyce, Coordinator, National Traveller Women's Forum. Maria. And I'd just like to thank the committee and the chair um, um, for the opportunity to speak here this morning today. As requested, we will speak on the, the need to address the stigma, prejudice, discrimination, racism, social exclusion and identity erosion experienced by travellers. Traveller women are one of the most marginalised groups in Irish society and traveller women's experience of inequality, oppression and discrimination differs to that of the majority population or other minority groups and their experience of racism and discrimination is different in some ways to traveller men also. The needs of traveller women may not be met by the responses and strategies designed to confront and tackle gender inequality or ethnic discrimination alone. There also needs to be an examination of the intersection of ethnic disadvantage, discrimination and racism to ensure the multiple forms of discrimination and racism is addressed for, as women and as travellers. As was heard earlier, traveller women have invested heavily of their time and their lives in building and supporting the traveller infrastructure, in representational roles and challenging agencies with regard to um, inequalities and travellers. We also need to keep in mind the diversity within the community and the challenges this poses for some of our members, as you've heard earlier on, around LGBTI travellers, but also for young traveller women in particular in attempting to negotiate their way around differing expectations and opportunities. The recognition of traveller ethnicity in 2017 was a very welcome development, but it's still largely, largely symbolic. We need to bring this to the next level to ensure it delivers real change for travellers. For ethnic minority groups, expression of identity and pride in identity is an important feature in creating a sense of belonging to society and for traveller ethnic recognition has always been about respect and inclusion it's about recognizing traveller culture and acknowledging the valuable contributions that travellers have made and continue to make in irish society but it's also about taking into account and addressing the inequalities traveller experience i won't go into the whole list of statistics you've heard them here earlier on higher um, significantly higher mortality rates suicides rates six and seven times higher, um, which account for 11% of all traveller deaths, infant mortality rates three times higher than the national average, and unemployment rates of over 80%. And there continues to be the significant gap between the participation and attainment of traveller children in education compared with children from the majority population. 
The identity erosion experienced by travellers has particularly impacted on our young people, leading to low self-esteem, poor self-image and a lack of pride in, in, in their culture. It also does and can cause stress, shame and depression and does lead to drug use and alcohol abuse and in some cases more severe mental health difficulties. The extent of racism and discrimination against the traveller community in Irish society is such that it's not uncommon for travellers to make deliberate attempts to hide their identity, to deny their identity or to choose not to disclose it, in particular when seeking employment. This has a particular negative impact on the opportunities and well-being of young travellers trying to access and stay in employment, and we would not have enough time today to talk about all of those examples. But our children also not have any quality of access, participation and outcomes from education. There needs to be visibility, it needs to be positive affirmation of our, tra our culture within our schools so that children have a sense of belonging and being part of. The NTWF, among others, have in our submission called for a new national action plan against racism to be put in place with, an o with the oversight committees that come with that in terms of representation from key stakeholders like travellers. And the evidence is borne out in such a way um, with regard to that. Um, you know, there's a range of studies and reports. 79% um, of, of settled people would be reluctant to purchase a house beside travellers. 40% of respondents to a, um, an Economic and Social Research Institute survey in 2017 said that they would be unwilling to apply a traveller. 18%, over 18% of respondents also said that they would deny Irish citizenship to travellers. The health study also shows significant discrimination against travellers in the health system and the providers recognising and acknowledging that. And again, the census shows dark statistics. 1% of travellers are on third level. Um, again, 81% of traveller women are unemployed. A study in 2016 that was referenced earlier by the Traveller Prison Initiative showed that Traveller women represented 22% of women in prison in 2016. Out of 1% of the population, that is reflective of the major inequality and racism that's there. Racism and discrimination experienced by travellers is all too acceptable within Irish society and at institutional level. In late 2018, as I earlier said, we saw the presidential person second, last in the race come in second based on the inflammatory and racist comments he made by tra about travellers. We see it in our judiciary, we see it in our political sphere and it goes largely unchallenged. And that gives credence and gives acceptability for the really blatant and casual racism that happens at societal level in terms of denial of access to shops, to restaurants, to pubs that travellers experience in everyday life. The negative attitudes, racism and stereotype needs to be comprehensively addressed with the introduction of appropriate hate crime legislation, which will also govern new mediums such as social media platforms, disseminating traveller hatred and racism. And Bridget will talk about that experience from a Cork context, but you can be sure it's reflective of a national. In terms of monitoring and implementation, I've given the key statistics. Um, but just to say, the accommodation situation of travellers in Ireland is appalling and at crisis level. The state's own numbers say that there's 20 years of failed implementation. 585 families are now living in unofficial, unrecognised and unserviced accommodation. That's without water and sanitation. <coughs> Over 1,000 families are sharing accommodation. 15% of travellers are homeless. And in the midst of all this, local authorities are refusing to spend their budgets with regard to traveller accommodation. The homeless crisis is disproportionately impacting on travellers. Traveller children are the highest percentage of homeless children in Dublin and travellers are 22% more likely to be homeless. Again, the introduction of the Public Order Act in terms of the housing miscellaneous provision gave increased powers of eviction to travellers and that needs to be stopped. Evictions need to be stopped. If stigma, prejudice, discrimination and racism is to be eroded, eliminated within the state it needs to ensure the existing strategies and policies developed in consultation with travellers are delivered on. There needs to be appropriate monitoring and departmental oversight committees and implementation plans including targets, indicators, timeframes and reinstatement of appropriate budgets including targeted measures. I am coming towards the end of it and I will finish. Um, as I said, you will see from the information we've provided in our submission the overwhelming lack of progress and implementation is a common theme across all areas of traveller policy. Um, and 
overall there is no accountability, accountability or sanctions on departments and state agencies when they do not deliver on their own policy context. The two most recent overarching strategies which were published in 2017, the National Traveller Roma Inclusion Strategy, NITRIS, and the National Women and Girls Strategy. The NITRIS contains 149 actions across 10 teams. There is no implementation plans with targets, indicators, timeframes or monitoring or special measures. And likewise, the National Women and Girls Strategy does not have an implementation plan for the five actions contained in it on traveller and Roma women. But also, there does need to be an examination of all the actions contained in the strategy to ensure they benefit the most marginalised of women, including traveller women. As you will have heard already in the sessions the NT and from the NTWF submission, Traveller women are invisible in the mainstream gender policies and reports and quotas. The target of 40% gender quotas on state boards has been reached with regards to women. There is no visibility of traveller women within that. And breaking through that glass ceiling regarding gender equality is even further out of the reach of traveller women in this country than it is of other women. And having just even their basic human rights realised is so far in, from, from where we're at at the minute that it needs to be addressed. Um, um, sorry, I forgot the name of the woman, the travel woman earlier who spoke. Um, Minnie. Minnie. Minnie spoke passionately about her own situation and it's, it's very telling of many traveller women's experiences. We should not have to be doing that in this day and age with all the evidence and strategies that are there with regards to the conditions that travellers and traveller women are living in. Um, it should not come to having to share that level of personal um, experiences to have this stuff addressed. And I'll finish there. Thank you. Now I hope I do better with this one uh, than I did the last time. On the, the far doing <laughs> of the National Action Group for LGBT and Traveller and Roma Rights. Away you go, to, go on. Um, Grawlty and good evening, um, and Kerlock and uh, committee members. I would like to thank you all for, in, in, for inviting the National LGBT Traveller and Roma Action Group to attend this meeting today. Specific recognition, of course, to Senator Colette Keller, who campaigned so positively towards creating such a, a space for inclusive dialogue. Our aim today is to give the Committee an understanding of the specific challenges facing LGBT travellers and the potential spaces available for co creative and empowering and progressive endeavours that could, and indeed we believe, should be undertaken. The LGBT uh, Traveller Aroma Action Group is one that provides growing support and adequacy towards within and throughout associated groups and issues raised throughout our community-led responses, training sessions, individual and family supports directly involve our advocacy work, and it is these experiences that inform our submission and input today. In addition to the general statistics and understanding of the issues and barriers experienced by travellers, which the committee and other guests have spoken so eloquently and horrifically of today, LGBT travellers experience an additional compression of these issues due to the factors such as taboo, internalised and external discrimination, fears, lack of awareness, lack of discussion on sexuality, sexual health, accessible and culturally aware avenues of support and the likelihood that local organisations will have family members associated, which often results in a hesitation to engage. The National Traveller um, Health Study uh, did not undertake to include LGBT travellers. However, we do have two studies conducted by the Clondalkin Travellers Development Group, one in 2012 and the other in 2019. The, re the results re reveal deeply concerning statistics and standards of the mental health um, among LGBT travellers. In 2012, 42% um, of those who had been, had been surveyed had a um, history of self-harm within the last year. 33% um, had suicide ideation and enactment within the last year. 83% resulted. 83% um, stated that these factors had, had direct relation towards their LGBT identity. The, aver the average age of suicide attempt uh, was 17.4, and the average age of coming out uh, for the few that did was 19.7. In 2019, 100 travellers were surveyed in the Clondalkin Newstown, um, Palmerstown, and Lucan area. Eight within that survey identified as LGBT. 46 reported that they, uh, did, they did not know any LGBT people. 56 found that, uh, that being LGBT was something to be ashamed of, and 84 what was stated they would not be interested in the LGBT awareness training. We understand that this is a small sampling, but it does highlight some issues that we are facing within the community, alongside many other pressures for, um, the, the travellers experience from outside of the community. 
As a group, we recognise the very legitimate past and ongoing and upcoming support options available for LGBT travellers. In the past year alone, um, along with LGBT Ireland and the Department of Justice, we relaunched a support poster, a series of training videos, and have undertaken some specific training with travel organisation, organisations. There is, however, so much more to be done. And I'd like to take the opportunity just to give some recommendations. The, um, the, objectives, the objectives within the Department of Justice's National Travel and Roma Inclusion Strategy and the Department of Children's and Youth Affairs LGBTI National Youth Strategy gives reference um, between them to include accepting and protecting LGBT travellers in our own communities, in the wider Irish society, especially in regards to encouraging and supporting links, developing of inclusion strategies, training modules and so forth, and challenging homophobia and transphobia around the support of traveller families. However, the conduits of this which, which is to be undertaken needs clarity, resourcing and, reinforce, and reinforcement if these objectives are in any way going to be realised. Um, we strongly recommend that a national LGBT uh, travel Roma awareness campaign that includes travel organisations, community groups and primary health networks and to, to be created and set up, as well as avenues for travellers who live outside of these networks to be included, supported and led out by LGBT travel voices. We would also recommend that the current draft of the, of the upcoming National LGBTI Inclusion Strategy that is, implemented, that is, that is, is to be implemented uh, in the near future, the measures to address intersectional discrimination that impact LGBTQI travellers, to be strengthened to include families. As far as there is a deficit in research and statistics, it is our clear understanding that the impact of the young marital age, which is 18.9, has resulted in a significant number of LGBT travellers being married. Currently, the Department of National, Health, um, National Sexual Health Strategy makes no mention of travellers. With this strategy due for renewal in 2020, we would recommend the inclusion of LGBT communities, including LGBT travellers. We also recommend the government, uh, in all governmental materials that include LGBT issues, specifically mention LGBT travellers, not only as a means regarding visibility, but the recognition of specific issues and barriers that they are encountered by LGBT travellers. We would then also like to recommend support towards the, the Traveller Culture and History and Education Bill. As many LGBT travellers experience a sense of disassociation and a genuine sense of distance from our culture and community, and increase positive awareness and understanding that, that could not only benefit LGBT travellers greatly, but our community and society as a whole. We, um, we would also like to recommend all community-based health ne um, networks, addiction and, and suicide prevention programmes should specifically include LGBT travellers, um, and that further research into this, the mental health, substance abuse, accommodation and support factors of, of LGBT travellers to be undertaken. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak to me, but I really would like to take the opportunity to really impress on people, people, people that we need to act is as immediate as possible. If we are going to turn the tides around stigma, social isolation, discrimination, and the all too common suicide, now is the time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Owen. Um, next, we've got Dr. Carl Kitching, Director of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, UCC. Uh, thanks very much, Kahir. here, look, and um, thank you for the space uh, to speak today. I'm very conscious of the privilege, privilege I have as a member of the cycle community um, speaking amongst. Uh, members of the traveller community and um, of the voices that are not here today, I suppose. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about one proposal uh, in the context that would, in the context of education, that would align with the, the work of the Traveller Culture and History Bill. Um, so member of, members of the traveller community in Ireland are routinely presented in statistics on formal education as deficient, as underachieving, and as underparticipating learners. Community-based state supports can maintain this deficit representation of travellers if they seek to fit communities into a school-shaped box, instead of examining what and who are valued by schools and education policy, and bridging home and school cultures in a meaningful way. Members of settled communities such as myself should never allow statistics on traveller participation and, and achievement in formal education to mask the everyday community learning that traveller children, young people and families are part of. Furthermore, we must recognise that institutionalised anti traveller racism, as, as a number of people have said today, is the cause of, of problems in formal education and beyond. As a society, we need to take more account of the fact that, as Professor Sonia Nieto argues, children learn how to learn as defined within their own particular cultural context. It is quite clear that the ways of learning and thinking about the world that are valued in our schools reflect the culture of the majority white settled population. We know that the community wisdom and the cultural literacy of traveller children and young people um, th that they have developed to negotiate their worlds are rarely used in their formal education. This places them at a systemic disadvantage. One simple example of this from my own supervision of teaching practice in schools with student teachers 
um, is how those teachers, when teaching students about the Irish language topic of Sawalia at home, al almost always present their learners with vocabulary regarding a two-storey house, but never a caravan, never a halting site, never even a flat. Uh, schools and teachers need to be able to bridge who students are with the economic demands and social expectations that society places on them. In other words, they need to, take, to make education relevant to all students, not just to, the, to those whose received cultural norms and biographies are similar to their own. Community wisdom and community cultural literacy are described by Professor Louis Moll as funds of knowledge. Funds of knowledge are, to quote, historically accumulated and culturally developed bodies of knowledge and skills essential for household or individual functioning and well-being, and of course community functioning and well-being. Moll and colleagues developed systematic projects with schools and Latin American families where teachers would visit and carry out in-depth research in their students' communities, examine classroom practices of their own, hold after-school after study groups with teachers, and bring community members in to speak um, at schools. The kinds of knowledge explored by teachers with communities in funds of knowledge projects include economic and household management, such as making, saving and spending money, childcare, budgeting and paying bills, oral traditions and storytelling, play and physical activity, re religious practices and moral codes, food and cooking, negotiating institutions like schools and hospitals, mechanical and technological knowledge like repairing engines or using smart devices, animals and the environment, um, issues around horse care, issues around pollution, and safety and protection. When brought into schools, these kinds of knowledge can form the basis of a whole year's worth of literacy work, of numeracy activities, of historical and human geography lessons, and so on. There are practical examples of how community knowledge can be brought into the classroom and how, their formal school, and how formal school learning can be enhanced with, with, so, with doing that. For example, in Hughes and Greenhouse research, parents were asked to encourage their child to decorate a shoebox and fill it with items like photos, toys, postcards, a book or a magazine, um, some writing or any pictures they had, um, and anything else that would be special to them. This can be used in a simple way to introduce children to their new teacher at the start of the school year, or, uh, um, or the teacher can use the contents of shoe boxes across the curriculum. Like in a maths lesson, the items can be weighed and measured. In a history lesson, the children can ex exchange boxes and ask, what can you tell about this person from the context of this box, from the contents of this box? A most obvious area is in literacy, where, children, where teacher can design weeks of writing around the contents of shoe boxes. But funds of knowledge can't be reduced to a nice little shoebox that can be put on a shelf. Rather, they require ensuring that teachers are active co-researchers with the marginalised communities that they teach. And I'm saying, I'm saying teachers with the assumption that most of them, as we know, are not members of the traveller community. Um, the concept of teachers as researchers of their own practice is becoming more and more common in Irish schools through the work of the Teaching Council and other fora. Yet teachers' engagements with students' communities, such as the traveller community, is often li limited to the work of homeschool liaison teachers. This represents a missed opportunity for teachers who are overwhelmingly white and settled to understand the lived experiences of, teacher tra oh, sorry, of traveller children and to move more practically beyond all too common assumptions of traveller learners as deficient. Failure to systemically use a funds of knowledge approach miss, presents a missed opportunity to have the wealth of traveller community knowledge take a meaningful place in schools and for more honest classroom and professional conversations about r the racism that travellers experience um, to be held in schools. National and cultural guidelines for schools, which have never been supported by systemic professional development for teachers, are simply not enough. I propose that we seek, uh, seize the opportunity to establish a Funds of Knowledge Commission designed in a similar way to the recent Schools Excellence Fund as a new element of Irish education policy. The purpose of this commission would be to fund tra tra teachers, but more importantly, traveller communities, to co-develop projects on how travellers' community knowledge and cultural literacy can be brought more effectively and systematically into the classroom and used to inform and reshape uh, formal school learning. I propose that this Commission would prioritise funding applications from school communities with greater proportions of traveller communities in the first instance. Uh, the notion of a Commission indicates that this work will be a valued part of sy systematic education policy to ensure that policy discourse on traveller education outcomes never starts from a negative deficit position. 
um, and recognises the debt that the education system and Irish society owes to travellers in terms of a fa failure to engage institutional racism and to challenge it. Ultimately, the Commission would seek to produce a range of materials documenting a insights into traveller cultural literacies and community knowledge and b ways in which schools need to fundamentally reconsider how formal literacy and a variety of cultural literacies, including those of the traveller communities, must be aligned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, Rose Marie Mon, here in Autistic Traveller Voices. Rose. Firstly, I want to thank you all, uh, the Chairperson and Senators, for this opportunity to raise the issue of the need to include the voice of autistic travellers. It has been said it's a very historic day for travellers, that it is, but it's more historic for autistic travellers because of the first times they have been mentioned. I hope to focus on issues affecting autistic travellers that have come to my attention as a traveller mother to an autistic child. The first concern we all should have is that I am not autistic. I am just a traveller mother to an autistic traveller child. This clearly highlights the lack of an autistic traveller voice representing themselves at present, which is very concerning to me as a traveller mother and as an activist. To understand their issues, we first need to understand what being autistic means and how it impacts on one's life. My understanding of autism from rearing my child so far and speaking with other autistic adults is that it is a neurological difference including the central, peripheral and autonomic nervous system. It means experiencing, thinking about and responding to the world differently to most people. It is not a disease in need of a cure. Autistic people should not be expected to be non-autistic. They should be loved, accepted and appreciated like everyone. Currently in Irish society there is very little meaningful understanding and acceptance of autistics. It is no different, unfortunately, in my community. We too have a lack of understanding and awareness of being autistic. In fact, as a community, we don't talk about being autistic and the autistic traveler voice has not been heard and is still missing in the development and implementation of national traveler policy, coupled alongside general policy impacting on their lives to date. An alarming example of this is if we look at the current traveller and Roma inclusion strategy, out of 149 actions, there's only one action that you can apply to autistic travellers, and that is a space for children with disabilities, but only in regard to the promotion of early childcare and education preschool scheme and promoted facilitated access via the access and inclusion model. Therefore, we have no stats on autistic travellers. We have no record of issues that they are facing in their lives, whether they are children, teenagers or adults, or elderly adults. And that is a major gap for our community. We also don't have useful stats from the general autistic community that we can rely back and compare. So when it comes to an autistic traveller child's development, we constantly hear early intervention is the key to their success into growing up to reach their true potential in life. Currently in Ireland, services are based on waiting lists, with over 100,000 on waiting lists for services such as speech, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, assessments of need and a diagnosis nationwide, according to HSE figures recently released. Once a child is finally assessed, they are put on another waiting list to be diagnosed, which can take up to another 14 months. Until they are diagnosed, in many cases, they can avail of no appropriate services. They get no support whatsoever. It is unclear among these stats how many are autistic traveller children and what services they require, and if indeed they are both clinically and culturally appropriate. With the majority of travellers well below the poverty line, we already heard the unemployment stat over 84%. We cannot afford to avail of private therapy for our children. Therefore, we are highly dependent on the domiciliary grant, which is another battle for parents who have to wait for a period of six months for a decision, which more often than not is a refusal. Parents then have to go through an appeals process, which again takes months to get a decision taken away from the crucial intervention time for your autistic child. A recent article in the Irish Times reported that in 2018, 81% of the domiciliary grant applications were won on an appeal, 
clearly needless non-refusals impacting on a child's life. One example of an autistic traveller child which should alarm everybody in this room is that he is three and a half years old, he is not speaking, he is waiting on early intervention and an assessment of need for two years and in that time he has had no service, no intervention, no guidance to his parents on how to support him. He also has no preschool place for September, he has no home tutor, his family cannot afford private therapy, his family were not aware of their rights and entitlements and they felt very isolated and helpless and nowhere to turn for support. So this traveller autistic child is being failed in every level imaginable which if not overturned will lead to a very negative outcome for him in so many levels into his future and the Irish state is failing him and so many more autistic traveller children like him. And I suppose my question to us to everybody in this room today is what are we going to do to help turn his life around so his basic needs and rights are being met as a traveller autistic child. From recent report Invisible Children launched by As I Am launched in April 2019 surveying families of autistic children facing barriers in securing schools in securing school places, it found that 54% of those surveyed were waiting for a school place, 24% of respondents were waiting less than a year, 76 were waiting for six months or up to three years, and 66% of respondents had applied to at least four schools. Again, it is unclear how many or if indeed any travellers were consulted in that survey or if they came forward or even if they were aware of that survey. It also found autistic children who do have a school place have to travel long distances to their school outside of their community. At present, autistic children, including autistic traveller children, are being failed by the state. And one example of a traveller autistic child within an AHD unit, which again should concern all of us, is that a young traveller girl who is not speaking yet, who uses her iPad as her preferred means of communication, sent with her in her bag to school on a daily basis, requested by her parents to be used, was not used. She also suffered several kidney infections from being unsupervised attending toilet breaks, which resulted her in being, great, her being in great pain and distress and requiring hospital attention, despite her parents requesting on numerous occasions to have her supervised during her toilet breaks. Again, clearly, this autistic traveller child's needs are not being met and her rights are being violated. Personally, I believe all children should be taught within the mainstream setting, equipped with capacity to teach them alongside their peers within their own community. To me, AHD classes, special schools are segregation, just like the similar segregation travellers face within the education system. And as we heard from many Connors over the generations, it still exists. Nothing has changed. And I would like to use a quote by a disability organisation which for me really sums it up. Uh, the organisation is starting with the Julius and the quote is, when we remove children with a disability from the diversity of our own community, from their rightful place in our regular classrooms and place them in a special needs classrooms, no matter how good the intention, we separate them from their peers, stigmatise them in their eyes and weaken the strength of their entitlement in the future to be part of that same community. Segregation in life leads to greater risk of segregation later in life. Autistic traveller children who cannot secure a place are entitled to a home tutor, for which, being a traveller, for which me being a traveller can see extra barriers autistic traveller children will face in trying to access this right if required. In terms of tutors not understanding traveller culture are wanting to homeschool a traveller child in a traveller pacific setting such as a halting site. Also the lack of trust that traveller parents have inviting a stranger who is not a non-traveller into their home alongside their child because of the general oppression they would have faced by the mainstream population. The July provision system throws up similar 
issues coupled with traveller parents not being aware of the system. The respite is another waiting list which again throws up cultural issues for autistic travellers and their families which needs to be discussed and designed with them. If we look at the general autistic community of which autistic traveller children and adults are part of yet are invisible with no real voice and not even being heard. And I know I'm getting the alarm bells um, to finish up, so I'll just wrap it up. I'll just get to my um, key recommendations, if I've that's okay. Time. I know. Well, hopefully I do, seeing that I'm a traveller. Um, if we look at the general autistic community, of which autistic travellers um, are part of, as I said, there is no real voice within the, main, the general autistic community. There is no voice coming th uh, forward within the traveller community itself. There is no stats for the autistic community itself or the traveller autistic community. But we can branch out as far as Sweden, which uh, carried out a research on the, the premature mortality uh, in the autism spectrum disorder, which uh, found that the life expectancy of autistic adults is 54 years, 40 years uh, if you're autistic with an intellectual disability, and the suicide being the second highest cause of death within the community and the primary cause for, for uh, autistic adults' death, suicide was a primary cause of their death. So it was very alarming statistics and very similar to Traveller uh, in general terms. So in conclusion, we are currently facing a human rights crisis of the autistic community, which includes autistic travellers, which is the tragedy on our history. The tragedy is not being autistic, but how society and the state are failing autistic, the autistic community and even more so autistic travellers because it is an additional violation of our human rights. We need to ask ourselves how can we turn this crisis into a positive for everyone, in particular autistic travellers. So the following are a few recommendations which can progress matters in a positive way. Traveller policy in progression needs to actively seek and include autistic traveller voices. There needs to be access to timely and appropriate services for all autistic children, including traveller children, from qualified staff regardless of location, access to assessment of need and diagnosis within three to six months, the prompt, the emulation of behavioralist methods and behaviour orientated intervention, parent, clinical and teacher training designed and developed by the autistic community members, including tra uh, autistic travellers, and the learning environment design led by autistic community members. Delivery of services must include the respect and acceptance to cultural background of each autistic individual to be served by that service. The support of structures that allow autistic travellers to self-advocate both within community settings and inter-community platforms would be vital vital in order to facilitate the space for autistic travellers of all ages to engage in a more meaningful ways. Also, being autistic is a very much natural part of the traveller community. However, the lack of awareness, understanding and acceptance all and others uh, creates additional barriers, fears and frustrations. So ensuring that the autistic awareness and acceptance, visibility and inclusion in all relevant traveller specific health promotional material, including mental health um, and traveller identity, would be essential in changing the narrative from the fear. I have so many more recommendations, but I suppose I'm getting the pressure. So that the key thing is that we have no stats. The traveller voice has been missing for the last 30 years. It is time now, as Owen has said, it's now or never. We leave nobody behind, and the key is to bring the, tra the traveller artistic voice in, analyse their needs, have their stats at the table, and most importantly, have the autistic traveller voice at every table from now on, including the upcoming uh, autism empowerment strategy. What you have maybe submitted, forgive me, I, you see, five minutes I was told, but you're gone 13 or 14, so this could, this could impact on the others. I must ask you all now, as far as you can, five minutes, okay? because there will be some questions after. We must finish for half two. Sorry about that. Okay, next we've got um, Thomas McCann, Traveller Counselling Service. Thomas. Yeah, thanks very much uh, for the opportunity to um, just kind of um, uh, briefly kind of touch on some of, the, some of the issues, and I'll try and keep it in the time. Please, the clock is not on that side of the wall, but <laughs> anyway, because I don't have a watch. Um, uh, anyway, um, an indication. Yeah, great. That, that, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, uh, 
I manage the Traveller Council Service. I'm a traveller and I've been involved in travellers' rights for about 35 years, although some people say a bit more. Um, uh, and, you know, a lot has been said and some of the things that I'll touch on has also uh, been said. Mainly my area of work is with mental health and some things has been said. In fact, I was going to start the session with answering one of the questions that was asked earlier on around suicide. Um, and I think um, one of the key things there would be the rec uh, implementation of the recommendations of the All-Party Oireachtas Committee on Mental Health uh, would be a good start in terms of uh, it, um, the implementation of a national traveller uh, mental health strategy which was recommended by the All-Party Oireachtas Committee. I think that would be a very good start uh, to, to start to address some of the issues. Um, in terms of um, uh, what I'm going to talk about, about erosion, uh, uh, ex exclusion, and, 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 and then touch on the media. Um, uh, really, um, travellers, the erosion of, and exclusion of traveller culture and identity is due uh, in no small way to state policy, uh, so it was, and uh, of assimilation and absorption, um, which gave, whether directly or indirectly, a permission to all the institutions of the state, including the media, to exclude traveller, culture and identity. And as I'll just quote from the, uh, the Commission on Itinerancy Report, um, that all efforts to support travellers uh, uh, should have as its ultimate aim the absorption of traveller culture. I mean, that's, that was the aim of this. And so, in that, in that regard, the Irish state has a responsibility uh, to address the issues uh, that travellers have faced, uh, because the erosion of traveller cultures uh, has created huge problems in terms of, as was heard, heard earlier on, some people were talking about uh, people hiding their identity. Um, if you lived in a state like this, uh, where you know, where if you, uh, it was mentioned about employment, about a whole range of other topics, that if you were known to be traveller, that you would be let go, that you would be excluded, that you would be discriminated against. I mean, there's many young people, we talked about youth earlier on, uh, there's many young people in, 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 in training uh, courses that can't say they're travellers. Uh, and if there's an article in a newspaper when people start talking in the, in the, in the canteen about travellers, uh, they feel, God, they feel really on the spot and feel that they can't address anything. They feel helpless in that situation. The, the reality of this erodes people, people's identity. It, it eats away at their self-esteem and their confidence. And it kind of, uh, what was said earlier on in terms of the internalization, that's how children learn, that's how we learn. We internalize our external environment. Uh, we internalize a certain shame about our identity and can, and that can really impact on our mental health that we struggle with, for, can struggle with for the rest of our lives and can lead to all kinds of things, such as drug use and, and addiction and all kinds of things. Um, in terms of the, just touching on kind of community, as travellers has experienced extreme levels of racism and discrimination, and I would say structural uh, exclusion and discrimination has been a key part of that, uh, so it has. And, like, I mean, in terms of just an example of this, there was a study mentioned in about 2017. There was also a study carried out in 2000, Citizen Traveller. And I'll just give you an example, and I'll tell you why I'm doing this. 36% uh, of Irish people uh, said they would avoid uh, travellers. 97% would said they would not accept travellers as members of the family. 80% would not accept travellers as a friend. And 44% would not want travellers as members of their community. Now, the reason I'm mentioning that is that the majority of them people had no direct contact with travellers. So, they did. so you'd have to ask the question, how was their attitudes and perceptions and biases uh, shaped? You'd have to ask the question about the media, the role of the media in this, and how that was shaped, some of them perceptions and ideas. Uh, okay, half a minute left, right, okay. Anyway, okay. I better move on. So. so, in terms of the media, the media carries a huge responsibility. We heard about Peter Casey in terms of giving a platform 
uh, and the issue of a local traveller accommodation issue being used uh, in a national platform that sprung his campaign from less than 3% to 21%, as far as I know. Uh, you know, and that, that, that really wasn't explored that well in the media in terms of the issues involved in that local issue, uh, so it was. But we can also see in terms of, you know, um, the, 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 the reporting in terms of sensationalist issues, particularly around conflict, while at the same time we had a conference in Dublin Castle just recently in April uh, looking at the impact of conflict in the traveller community uh, on mental health. Where was the media to be seen? There was, like, there was 180 people at that conference, uh, the majority of whom were travellers. Uh, there was very little media presence there. Yet, if there's an argument somewhere in the middle of nowhere, you have half the media. So, I think in terms of a few recommendations, and then I'll stop, because I'm going to... I'm Can I say this to you, and to Rose? Anything you feel you haven't covered, yeah. feel free to give okay. it in by okay. way of written submission. Okay. It will be taken on board. I thought five will, minutes would stretch longer, but anyway. No, okay. Collette will be happy to deal with all of that. Okay. We'll deal with it as a committee. Okay. There's a couple of issues, there's a couple of things then that need to happen. One is that, the, uh, just a couple of recommendations. You know, you... A couple of recommendations. Look, look. One. There, there needs to be an advisory council. out fast. There needs to be an advisory council and the press ombudsman. Uh, made up of travellers and members of the media to look at uh, the reporting in the media. Likewise, in the national broadcaster, RTE, uh, I mean, they have a responsibility to make sure that the programmes uh, and the reporting on traveller issues are fair and accurate. And I think that's where advisory groups comes in. I think a national action plan on racism that addresses the issue of uh, the media is also inclusive. And the, and, and the last point I'd make is on participation. Uh, and this is the final point. Participation, you know, can bring about change and the participation of travellers. However, participation can also cloak, you know, the power inequalities and business as usual unless participation is properly resourced and it's on an equal footing. Thank you very much. Now we've got the Cor Traveller Women's Network and we've got Bridget Carmody and Louise Harrington, coordinator and community development worker, and I gather you're sharing time, so you'll take two and a half minutes each, right? Yep. Which we want to go first? I'll go first. On you go. Yep. So thank you. I, um, I too am going to talk a little bit about the media coverage. Um, media coverage for travellers is something our project has taken a particular interest in over recent years. We understand that the media can shape the public's understanding of us, especially for many of the public who have never had have little or none face-to-face -face contact with the travelling community. So often people can create an assumption of who we are and what our culture is based on media stereotypes. Media coverage also has a huge effect on travellers, especially our young people who are connected with media and in particular social media. To start, I'd like to read out a statement from the media in Cork over the last year. This statement, unfortunately not unusual, to encourage the public to call a local radio chat show, the heading was, the north side is ruined. And this was followed by an anonymous letter sent to the station saying, I'm sending this email as a distraught Northsider who was sick of seeing the Northside being ruined every day by travellers. Now just wait for the bleeding hearts, the ethnic minority and It's Our Culture campaigners to start. Unfortunately, we've seen firsthand in Cork local media uses this type of feature to invite members of the public to phone in and air every gripe they, have, they can think of with the sweeping, sweeping negative statements against travellers. So imagine this happening three or four times a year in a local radio station, which is usually playing in the local shops, garages, taxis, hairdressers. Imagine having to use those services with your children. When this happens, the traveller projects are inundated with phone calls from distressed travellers talking about the hurt and shame of being stereotyped, rejected in a community that they've lived in all their lives. Travellers are calling on our project to respond to this type of media coverage, but we're struggling and need support to do this. Firstly, there need to be a targeted Traveller Roma communi Communications initiative to promote the many positives within our community and set out National Traveller Roma Inclusion Strategy. This communication in initiative also needs to be included supports for local community development projects in dealing with the media. I also want to bring your attention to the online social media pages of newspapers and radio stations. 
While we do not have the resources to monitor these fully, we have been informally recording some of the public comments which follow pretty much any mention of travellers, good or bad. To give a small few examples, the following story of a fa traveller family in need of accommodation. Here are some of the comments. Inbreeding, inbreeding doesn't make you a race, sweetheart. Blacks are human, knackers ain't. Burn them out. Just bring in a tank of slurry and start spraying. Bring them to the shooting range, good target practice for a boys in green. And a few litres of petrol and a match will sort them out. Under a, a recent positive article on Cork Traveller Pride celebrations, the first two comments were, Traveller Pride, what have they got to be proud of? And a comment suggesting that travellers are thieves and had stolen the items that are on display for Traveller Pride. It is unrealistic to expect travellers and traveller projects to police and report every single racist comment on social media pages, our newspapers and radio stations. This needs to be done by, local, by the newspapers and radio stations who also broadcast their news online through social media. They need to have obligation and pre-monitor comments on their page and remove hate speech and racism. And now I'll pass you on to the ways. And you go, Louise. Okay. Thanks, Bridgie. Um, so to follow up, I would like to talk about raising the bar and creating a more proactive media around challenging racism with a number of practical suggestions. Currently, the role and standards of the Press Ombudsman and the Press Council of Ireland does not include the online pages of their media members. We would like to see this reviewed to place an obligation on their members to proactively monitor uh, pre-moderate comments and eliminate hate speech from their online platforms and similar for members of the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. We would like to see the development of media standards around racism and the coverage of minorities and ethnic groups to include the development of an anti-racist protocol and training for journalists around the duty to report, report in a fair and balanced and non-racist manner. Once standards around anti-racism and the media were developed, a system of merit could be awarded to recognise media channels and journalists who champion good practice. Media reporting on minorities and ethnic groups is a powerful communication tool that, sh that can shape society's attitudes. We would love to see a platform created for the media to review and reflect on their role in exposing racism, by reporting on it, which can also normalise and reinforce racism versus their role in challenging racism. To expand on this, we give the example of some, media, some of the media coverage around the most recent presidential campaign, which has been mentioned already, but gave considerable air time to targeted anti-traveller sent sentiments and effectively normalised this and gave an air of respectability to these sentiments and to traveller ethnicity denial. We are also concerned about racist views being justified in the media by an understanding that it, it represents journalistic balance. So, as it would not be morally acceptable today to introduce a misogynist to comment on International Women's Day for journalistic balance, it should no longer be acceptable to include the comments of a traveller ethnicity denier or an anti-traveller spokesperson to give journalistic balance every time travellers are talking about human rights in the media. And finally, just to say, I believe traveller groups, um, certainly the Cork Traveller Women's Network, would welcome the opportunity to build closer strategic links um, around building trust with journalists and media outlets who are open to supporting human rights and the fair treatment of travellers in the media. Thanks. Thank you very much. And finally, Anish Barry, Chief Executive, Free Legal Advice, Free Legal Advice Centres. Flack. Um, Flack welcomes warmly the opportunity to make this submission and this opening statement to this very important uh, committee. Our recommendations are based on Flack's experience in the JustTram programme, which was a Council of Europe initiative, and within this programme, we supported the running of legal clinics for travellers and Roma. Um, as part of that program, we were very struck by the level and extent of unmet legal need um, that travellers experience, particularly in relation to housing, standards of accommodation, evictions, and discrimination in relation to access to goods and services, including licensed premises. 
We believe that access to justice is essential both to addressing unmet legal need, but it's also integral and essential for social inclusion. And we hope that access to justice is a foundational theme to this committee's report. <coughs> the enforcement of rights and obligations in relation to the provision of services, education and accommodation under the, equal, uh, under the equality legislation is critical to access to justice for travellers. However, rights are only effective insofar as they can be enforced. And at the moment, there's no legal aid available for persons to bring claims of discrimination under the equality legislation uh, and in relation to social welfare appeals and uh, claims, no matter how complex or how important the issue is, how little resources the potential claimant may have, or the capacity of the complainant to represent him or herself. The Minister for Justice um, can enable the Legal Aid Board to uh, provide uh, uh, legal aid in discrimination claims and in social welfare matters by simply de designating the Workplace Relations Commission and the Labour Court and Social <coughs> Welfare Claims and Appeals Officers uh, within the Civil Legal Aid Act. So it doesn't need a uh, legislative change. There is also a misperception and a lack of clarity as to the extent to which the Legal Aid Board can deal with issues of housing. And we believe there's nothing in the Civil Legal Aid Act which stops it providing legal aid in cases dealing with the legal responsibility of local authorities and the state in relation to housing and homelessness. The Legal Aid Act, however, does need to be amended to ensure that legal aid is available in eviction cases, and PLAC has furnished to the Minister an amendment which, if enacted, would ensure that legal aid would be available. We also note that the number of complaints under the equality legislation to the Workplace Relations Commission in, in, in the Equal Status Act is reducing, which is surprising. And the number of discrimination claims against licensed premises has plummeted since the jurisdiction was transferred to the District Court, even though legal aid may be available for claims against licensed premises. And we would like to the committee to recommend that the Legal Aid Board would engage in an information campaign about legal aid entitlements in housing and in discrimination claims against licensed premises. And also that the committee would re recommend a targeted co coordinated information campaign about the important provisions in the equality legislation by bodies such as IREC the, the Workplace Relations Commission, the Citizens Information Board, uh, and coordinated with traveller NGOs. Um, in relation to accommodation, FLAC recommends that uh, the Senate Committee seek a commitment from the Minister that when the report on the Experts Review Group is published, that immediate steps would be taken to implement uh, its recommendations. In relation to standards and traveller-specific accommodations, we would recommend the immediate review of, of guidelines published in 1990, 1998 in relation to traveller accommodation, and also to extend the standards that are there for rented housing under the Standards for Rented Housing Regulations 2019 to include halting sites, including transient, temporary and permanent halting sites. There's a range of legislation uh, that allows for summary evictions and in our submission we're calling for the Minister to review such legislation to ensure that except in the most exceptional of circumstances a family home can never be interfered with uh, without the absence of a merits-based determination by a court and uh, an onus been put on the local authorities to offer alternative appropriate accommodation. We, we echo previous submissions that the positive duty is a very important national uh, mecha mechanism for mainstreaming equality and human rights for travellers. And we believe that um, the very broad range of public sector bodies who are covered by it won't be able to establish they've complied with it unless they engage in meaningful ongoing consultation with groups representing the discriminatory grounds that are covered in the equality legislation. <coughs> In relation to hate speech, we would ask that uh, the committee would ask why does Ireland still have a reservation in relation to Article 4 of CERD, which deals with incitement to hatred. And we would also ask the committee to recommend that Ireland should incorporate uh, the convention into Irish law. In relation to fair and accurate treatment in the media, um, 
actions in defamation are expensive and are very difficult to pursue. And there's a blanket exclusion of defamation proceedings from the Civil, Aid, Civil Legal Aid Act, which means in effect that defamation uh, claims under the Defamation Act are only available to people with significant resources. Further, the protections afforded by the Defamation Act is limited only to protect individuals or a corporate entity targeted. So more generalised hate speech against a group isn't in fact covered. And we would recommend um, that uh, this would be reviewed to uh, provide a, a, civil, a, a civil remedy for groups who are targeted by hate speech. Um, there's been an ongoing review of the Prohibition on, on Incitement to Hatred Act for some time, and we would recommend um, that this review would be carried out in tandem with the review under the Defamation Act to ensure that there is a, a civil remedy available for hate speech. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you all for your interesting contributions. Uh, now, in view, we have to be out of this chamber by half two. What I propose to do now is I'm going to take questions from senators. I'm going to limit them, because I've got to come back to you. I'm limiting them to two minutes each for a question, not a second stage speech, as we had earlier. And I'll start with them in the order I have a few here. No, Patrick O'Kadig is first. <laughs> Patrick O'Kadig, he didn't speak now. And, uh, you're very, very welcome. It's great to see you here. Thanks for, for coming along. And Colette, in particular. I'm, I'm timing now, and I just want to. All right, question. I'll be very, very quick. A question, uh, yeah. A couple of areas, if you could just give us two or three points on the following key areas uh, for me. Health, education, culture, you've spoken a lot about uh, media and free legal aid. It's just two or three points that we need to learn and take with us from each of those. I'd certainly be certainly very much appreciated. And just one last thing, there was a, a fellow from Galway, who, uh, where I'm from, actually, I'm part from a minority as well. I had to learn English. I grew up speaking Irish in the Connemara Gaeltacht. And quite frankly, I believe there's racism against us as well in the Connemara, in, in the Gaeltacht regions. We've up to 40% unemployed in many cases. Up to 40% of people don't even go to secondary school in some of the Gaeltacht areas. But one brief story. There's a young man who made me really, really proud as a Galway man. Back in 1996 in the Olympics in Atlanta. You know what I'm talking about? Francie Barrett. He carried the Irish flag in the Olympics that day. And he was actually, a year or two afterwards, barred from going into a nightclub in Galway. He had to bring in action, which he won as a result. There was a film made about it. It won a big award in the New York uh, uh, Film Festival in 1999 called Southpaw. And quite frankly, nothing has changed since. And we need a good big kick in the backside, all of us, to try and make it happen. But, Colette, from what you've done, at least it's a one small step, but a critical step along the road. And what people like Chris and so on are doing on your behalf is actually promoting, which is something, you have a culture that's very, very important to Ireland. And it's so important to maintain it and keep it. But if you could just get back, and my two minutes are up, those key areas, just two or three points on each of those, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Senator. I've got the Leader of the House next, Senator Cherry Butler. And Senator Keller for today, and as a member of the, the group, Keller, just to thank all the participants uh, for being here in, in the sessions. My question for today is very simple. Based upon our two presentations in the two sessions, what is a realistic outcome that we can expect from today, uh, given that we've heard a lot of very um, informative, provocative, and challenging statements, and I want to thank all the people who gave presentations. Um, and I think the one thing that I hope we can take from here, Carlock, is that institutionally uh, we can challenge each other, but also collectively in the context of relationship with the media, that we can see a better relationship and a, and a, and a, and a better presentation. Because, as I know from Cork, um, as a former chairman of the Travel Accommodation Committee and City Council, there's a lot of great work being done that doesn't get told, and thank you for being here. Senator, uh, Senator Terry Lynn. I'd just like to commend uh, Senator Keller on his rapporteur arranging this, indeed a very wise choice of the recommendation of me on Martin appointment by Andy Kenny, that you remember this House, and it's really proved very successful. And to also... Very, well, it's very relevant to the point, I'm just saying the calibre of the candidate and the point she raised today. 
But furthermore, uh, earlier on, I was uh, delayed to come out by, to come by train, but I heard uh, many of the contributions earlier on today. And I must commend those who were here today and those who spoke, spoke earlier in relation to need for education, housing, very fundamental issues. And uh, just say it, it's a great exercise here today, and I, just, it is a wonderful exercise. And I, I heard all the contributions here today, and I just think it's most enlightening. And I'm not going to respond to any or all. I'm just going to put one question, one question, a very short question. The former teacher, again, to Kenny, Kenny made, a, uh, made a statement to Dáil Éireann on Wednesday, the 1st of March 2017. He announced formal recognition for travellers as a distinct ethnic group within the state. Many years, travellers' communities had for, uh, campaigned for this, to have their unique heritage, culture and identity formally recognised by the state. Has there been any legislation to bring that into reality? It was an aspirational statement made by the Taoiseach, but to my knowledge, there has been no really follow-up on a, a legislative basis. I'd like a response to some very people here that know the situation. I'd like to get a response Thank to that. You. Thank you, Senator. Senator Lynn Ruan. Thank you, um, so I'll be brief, but there is four questions aimed at different people. So um, Marie, Owen and Rose, I suppose I can pack my questions to you, which you answer them slightly different, but they're kind of along the same thread in the sense of how is the mainstream movements in each of those areas failing when it comes to being culturally sensitive, I suppose, to the issue of gender, the issue of LGBT, and then also whether it be invisible disabilities like autism? Because obviously there's huge movements, there's been huge kind of progression in the mainstream in them areas, but it has failed, I believe, to have that intersectionality and that understanding uh, of, of the cultural um, aspect that it also is, is in, in gender or LGBT or in terms of disability. So I'm wondering, what can the mainstream groups do better to work and uh, be more inclusive and be more um, you know, progressive, I suppose, in air policies and air efforts to actually make sure that all people are included, but also understanding that, that there is cultural differences and respecting them. Um, my other question then is for Lynn Scarf. In relation to the collaborations with the, the National Museum of Ireland in terms of traveller participation, traveller given their experiences, their times, their contributions, um, you spoke about, I suppose, equal leadership and collaboration between the groups. I'm wondering how many travellers are employed officially um, throughout them processes and are travellers actually being paid for their time, experiences and the resources if there is an equal partnership between the National Museum and the travelling community. Um, my last question then is to Carl Kitchen which are around the, the, the funds of knowledge. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, I think it's all well and good saying, you know, we set up like a commission in terms of teachers research in the travelling community and stuff, but has kind of history not proven that anybody that moves into those areas in terms of research and giving their time already care? And the thing is that our schools are you know, covered across the country with people that hold huge prejudice and don't want to actually teach traveller kids. So how do we actually get to them? Because I think if you're willing to engage in the, in, in the funds um, of knowledge piece, you obviously already care enough to even challenge yourself in that position where there's obviously huge portions of teachers that won't even make that, um, I suppose, progression into looking at how they carry prejudice or unconscious bias into their classroom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Alice Mary Higgins. I um, just want to thank um, all of the speakers, um, and again, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Some of the points, I think... Question, uh, please. Question. Oh, it is questions. It is, uh, but uh, the, the issues that were brought up very well, I think, in discussing uh, prejudicial language in the media and, and, and hate speech and all of the, the framing of debates and the allowing of debates, I was very struck by uh, the debate that was, you know, where you had a conference that wasn't covered, but an individual incident will be covered. And I think... Um, what I'd like to, the question really is that is that question of when you find yourself that travellers in terms of the media are having the agenda framed around them where they are having to be in a responsive or in a defensive position, how does that affect in terms of traveller voices being heard on the big collective issues of the state. So, for example, that traveller perspective on the issues you've mentioned, like LGBT issues, uh, issues um, of, of autism, issues of disability, and of the collective project. And I guess I, I would just comment on terms of the positive input of traveller voice, of traveller culture, uh, of traveller perspectives, 
on the state. And I think there's also a historical issue too where uh, traveller contribution to the Irish state has sometimes become a little bit invisible, whereby when somebody does contribute a lot, if they're a traveller, that aspect of their, of their identity it can disappear. So maybe just a comment in terms of like, what would it look like if you had a positive participation in the media? Um, and also it was mentioned the national, uh, national anti-racism strategy. Um, the national anti-racism strategy, we of course used to also have the National Consultative Committee on Racism and Interculturalism. Um, we had all of that 10 years ago, and I'm just, well, 11 years ago now. And I'm wondering if you could comment on uh, if you feel those kinds of infrastructures, like a National Consultative Committee on Racial and Infrastructure, something similar, what should be in place uh, now uh, in terms of an national anti-racism strategy as well. Um, and then finally, just coming back on education and culture again, I think just to mirror my colleague Senator Wan's point, I think it is important that it's not simply an optional thing, but that traveller history and culture is, as our legislation from our CEG group, led by uh, Senator Kelleher on this, um, Thanks. should be part of the education for everybody because it is about ensuring all voices participate in the state and that they Thank bring you. their full identity to that conversation. Thank Thanks. you, Senator. <laughs> Two minutes now. Senator Paul Gavin. Questions? I want to thank you for your presentations today. I want to apologise for the fact that I wasn't able to attend all of them. I want to commend Senator Keller in particular who has been passionate about this topic from day one uh, in here. Two quick questions, uh, Liska Hillock. The first is just in relation to the horrific um, media contributions that we've seen in the last year. I'm thinking of, of, of radio in particular, talk radio, but, but also a very well-known journalist, I won't name, uh, for one of the big media groups. And I just want to ask, um, can some of these people make Donald Trump sound like a liberal? I mean, they're, they're the most hate-filled speech. What can we as public representatives do after today, collectively, because I think there seems to be a goodwill across, across the board here, to really make a difference to challenge those prejudices, that hate speech? And then the second question is in relation to, to the issue of education, Ms. Gehirlock. In terms of what changes would you make to the teaching profession in terms of training in particular uh, to try and make a difference in, in that respect in terms of a more inclusive uh, approach from teachers? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Mara Devine. Uh, thank you, uh, Lasker Hill. Like, just one, one question really is um, the idea of the nomadic culture, uh, but also just very ordinary visiting family and friends, and we need to go north to south, and we're leaving Brexit aside. Um, can anybody kind of, I suppose, give uh, examples now of what the disadvantage, if the difficulties are at the border, uh, what is you know, the legislation up there as opposed to uh, the legislation in the 26 counties and how that can be kind of, uh, I suppose, understood and whether or not we can do something about raising the profile of what happens at the border. I suppose there's echoes of borders across Europe and borders across uh, the US or the imposed ones and um, what happens there but just the, the, the sense of what goes on when you cross the border to go fi visit family and friends is it extra difficult? Any other questions? Senator with a question? No. Thank you. So I'll go straight back to your good sellers for a wind up and an answer to those questions. Will I start with you Chris? Do you want to pick up anything there? I think for me from the, from the mediation side of it we have uh, disputes of, of different towns in, in, in Ireland and what gets me all the time, the local guards, if they don't know travellers, and the media are constantly calling them feuds. It's actually pouring petrol onto the fire. A lot of these are just disputes. They could be one-to-one -one neighbourly thing. So for me, I think through the mediation side, I like to think Thomas has said it, it should be more put on reporters and what they say and what they can say. It by, just by telling the truth, just to be fair, and that's all we look for. Thanks very much. Um, Dennis, if you wish to answer that question there. With regard to the education, um, and it's such a wide topic, I think um, we have to look at uh, certainly how the curriculum is and how it mentions or doesn't mention this unique ethnic group in our country. And that has to be um, included further, I think. Also, the shortened timetables that yeah. some students still experience in Ireland, where their uh, travelling students are sent home earlier or start later, I think that needs to be looked at and see how rampant or not that is um, in our schools. And also the encouraging of um, 
younger travellers how to get them involved in becoming teachers. How attractive can we make it? We're very happy to run back to Dubai or other places where Irish teachers are and bring them home. Well, let's nurture it among um, younger travellers, I think, would be important. Uh, Maria, yeah, would you like to answer a question? In relation to some of the wider questions around a couple of points around health, education and culture, the answer to that is, is that they're all there. There's a whole platter of strategies and policies with regard to travellers, whether it's in health in terms of the traveller the, the traveller health strategy in 2010, the education strategy in 2006, um, the, the current NITRA strategy. Um, and going right back to 1990 and the first task force report that's in a shift in the policy direction away from assimilation through segregation to inclusion. The reality is, is we've not seen implementation of those recommendations and that's really unfortunate. And in terms of education, very briefly in terms of it, we have saw a number of hearings with the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Education and Science since the beginning of this year. They published two reports last week, one on the wider issues pertaining to the disadvantage with regard to travel children in secondary level and third level, and one on reduced timetables. We need to see implementation of the recommendations contained in those um, reports in the education strategy and with regard to the NITRA strategies on education. There's huge inequality, as you've heard, with regard to traveller children and school. There's invisibility of traveller culture. There's no sense of recognition and belonging. Um, so there needs to be also a stamping out of, of discriminatory practices within schools, um, you know, in terms of enrolment policies. And there was an opportunity in our legislation, the legislators to do this last year in relation to enrolment policies that disproportionately impact on traveller children and other groups of children, but traveller children in particular, where there isn't a previous history of education involvement. So therefore, if your <coughs> father or your sibling, older siblings didn't go, you're immediately excluded. There's a need for proactive, positive measures right across all of this policy. And in education, in, learn, in terms of looking at traveller teachers within the system, that will go a long way to starting to address a child being able to sit in that classroom and see traveller teachers who are who are happy, and there is traveller teachers out there, and they are identifying. But we need more of that in terms of, of, of that. We need um, data. Data is huge across all of these areas. If we, we you know, and the, the, there is a beginning of collected data in primary school. Having said that, it needs to be right across all levels of education, because if we don't have the data, then we, we, we won't, you know, in terms of the needs that need to be responded to around that and the monitoring that needs to be put in place around it. Can I just briefly say then finally on the question from Lane around the wider gender piece and um, um, I mean, the reality is, is that traveller women are lost within the wider gender movement and traveller women are at, at the core <coughs> phase trying to address the issues and the very stark issues with regard to impacting on travellers. I mean, you know, you've heard it throughout the day in terms of just getting their children to school, having access to those schools, in terms of trying to battle with services around basic rights in terms of accommodation and health. So they have, there's, you know, they've got laws and in some ways the whole gender movement in Ireland is a bit middle class and it wouldn't be just travel women that are lost within that. But I do think, and there is solidarity from some groups out there, but there needs to be really looking at the wider gender policy and when you talk about quotas and systems for gender they need to have diversity within those quotas there needs to be traveler women quotas within those also just in terms of um, the policies that are out there they need to be traveler women specific or the actions and the recommendations contained in like the, the, the national travel <coughs> the national women and girls strategy Five are pertaining to traveller and Roma women. There's a whole platter of other ones, some of them that are being marked as, you know, implemented, but no evidence of what that means for traveller and other marginalised women. So those are the kind of things that need to happen. I mean, just if I can say one final point on that, I went to a number of events to mark 2016 in terms of 100 years um, you know, of, of, of our independence. And also at the beginning of 2017, where the first uh, woman in the doll. And I was standing there in one of those where, the pre where President Higgins, your father, was talking, Alice. And I, it just struck me, we're still without the visibility of traveller women across all of those structures, as you've heard here this morning. So there is an onus 
on the wider mainstream groups to address and the state to force them to address it as well. Thank you. Uh, have you any brief comment there, Lynn? Uh, just here, uh, to come back on Senator Rand's question in relation to the collaboration and contributions. So, um, obviously within selection panels yet, but in terms of our recommendations, it is something that I think is really important within cultural institutions is the diversity of our workforce, and that isn't there right now. We need to do much more work on that and think about how we set up programmes to enable it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas, you have yeah, something uh, brief to add? Yes. Uh, just a few points. I think from a travel perspective, it would go a long way. Uh, to start to begin to heal some of the hurt would be an apology from the state uh, to travellers on uh, what has been the difficulties and, and the exclusion that the state has caused the travellers. I think that's what travellers are looking for on the ground, and so I, I think that would be a starting point. I think accountability for the, for the lack of implementation in policies needs to be put, because I mean participation is one side of it, and political participation and the drawing up of policy. However, implementation, there needs to be accountability. If there's no accountability, we'll continue with a lack of implementation, and as Marie says, you know, that has been the the way, for, the way since, since policies has been uh, developed. Um, we need a national body, as was said, with responsibility for developing and implementing a national action plan to combat racism, and we really need that, not just for travellers, but across the board. This society is a multi-ethnic society, and like, I mean, you know, kind of, it's, so we really need, as a state, we really need to develop it collectively. I think that's you know, something that needs to be there. And that was there and was developing. Unfortunately, that was cut and that was the end of that. In terms of health and other services, an ethnic identifier for travellers. Travellers has been, and traveller organisations has been calling for it for years, for at least 10, 15 years, for an ethnic identifier in, across the services, but particularly in the health services, in the mental health services. We can't get the figures. So how can you plan a service when you can't really get the, the exact figures? And we're not talking about individuals. We're talking about the numbers of the community. And, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the last point of making that is the implementation of the All-Ireland Traveller Health Study, which was carried out with, with, a, with a lot of travellers across the country and still is sitting there on the shelf. So thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Owen, any brief comment or response? I'm trying not to repeat any of the good points made by people, but um, I just have a few. One was in regards to ethnicity. I think that that's a discussion that we can continue to have, but at the moment, as a community, we are struggling to even get basic uh, supports, accommodations, healthcare. So I think that sometimes that's why ethnicity is incredibly important. Our basic needs are still not being met. Next would be uh, the importance of inclusion within the institutions. That can't be uh, underestimated or underestimated. And also uh, regarding the LGBT overall movement, um, Trevor are not a part of that. We're visual every so often at uh, pride parades and, and uh, one or two events, but sometimes they're actually very anti traveller is almost asking usually young, uh, cis, gendered men, how badly have other travellers treated you? So the actual narrative is an inclusion, and kind of looking at the current strategy, the engagement around um, travellers around the LGBT kind of strategy is very, very weak. And I think that's, that itself is a testimony. That itself is, and also, how are they actually inclusion us with the formations of those policies? And the next would be the hate speech legislation. I think that everyone today totally agrees with that. But I actually also really thought the point of nomadism and the board would be very interested, and very interesting because we can't even move. Most people don't even consider the border. We're not, we're not a community that is allowed to be nomadic. Even my local TAP programme, there is a, which is currently in draft, thankfully, so we have a challenge to push back. It's only for those indigenous to our, our local county. Um, they're terminating temporary sites, and there, there is no mention on the idea that travellers can't travel. And I think that's a much wider discussion. So I think while Brexit is going to have an impact on us, I think that at the moment we're already in crisis. Thank you, Car um, Owen. Karen, any brief comment? No? Uh, response yeah, in response to the education questions, um, Senator Ruan asked there about funds of knowledge. I suppose there's an action in the nature strategy and in the migrant integration strategy around anti-racist and intercultural education training, professional development for teachers. I haven't seen it happen. Um, it's something that needs to be prioritised, but unfortunately, again, it's something that's sitting there on a shelf at the moment. Uh, in terms of getting people um, who otherwise would not be that interested uh, to get involved, I suppose that training, first of all, needs to be man mandatory. And second, um, the inspectorate, I, I mentioned the school's excellence fund as an example of how, of, of a parallel, um, as an example of something that, that um, this could emulate. 
Um, the inspectorate are very much involved in that, and I think having the inspectorate very much involved in um, working with schools to uh, fund applications would, make, would, in, would incentivize it for schools and communities to work together. I, I would be the first to say that um, sometimes you're preaching to the choir and that it's, it can be very, very difficult to get people who ultimately are otherwise not interested. Um, and then in terms of uh, wider professional development, we've seen the PATH scheme, the PATH 1 scheme, 2 and 3, um, have some good success in terms of access to higher education, and particularly PATH 1 in terms of uh, access to, uh, for underrepresented groups to teacher education and becoming teachers. We really need to support and expand the PATH schemes, um, and particularly uh, you know, uh, focus on, I suppose, the experiences of traveler teachers in that respect. Um, more needs to be done. So I think there is a lot of good recommendations out there, it's, it's about actually making them real. Thank you, thank you, Carol. Brief response to any of the questions, Rose. Yes, um, I suppose the, the most important thing seeing that I'm raising the voice of autistic travellers is that no policy, no legislation going forward is developed or designed or implemented without their input. Otherwise, we are doing an injustice to the most vulnerable voice in the fact that it's not been heard and it hasn't been heard. Um, in terms of education, I agree with the good points that have all have been said, that it must be a, a really inclusive setting where travellers are welcomed, celebrated, and that goes across the board within the education curriculum. And also, teachers should not be qualified as teachers unless they have gone more undergone mandatory training on what it is to be autistic and what it is to be a traveller and how that impacts on the child's life and how to appropriately teach that child with that in the, within the context of teaching. Very important point as well, just to pick up on where Owen left, left off on nomadism. As you rightly put, we are not able to move north, south, any corner of this country. The 95 task force of the travelling people did identify that 1,000 units of transient sites would be developed. Under 50 have been developed. They're not used as transient sites. It is illegal to be a traveller. It is illegal to travel. Therefore, our culture has been eroded, wiped out right under our noses, without our meaningful consultation. We are, if we do travel, we are, suffer, we are faced with evictions from pillar to post, one caller to the other. If we try to engage within the mainstream uh, residential caravan parks, we face discrimination. That is not even our culture. If our ethnicity, our ethnicity was recognised on the 1st of March of 2017, let that mean something. Let that mean that we can have our culture. Let that mean that we don't die anymore without having the right to be nomadic. Let us travel rightfully across the land of our Ireland. Um, Bridget and Louise, have you a brief response to any of those questions? Um, just, just to say that you know, legislation has to be put in place around the media. Our children can't continue um, to have to hide their identity in schools and work. I work with a young, girl, a young girl who works in a hairdresser's who had to stand there and wash a woman's hair while she talked about her family and her people, you know, and she had to take part in that conversation and she's carrying, they're carrying all of that. You know, so having to justify your community all the time is having a huge effect on our children's mental health. Thank you very much. Did you want to conclude um, Just a couple of comments to uh, senators who asked the question about what might it look like with a more positive environment in the media. Um, I suppose just to say, like communication around culture can also be done with partners around um, museums and other cultural institutions. Um, our submission includes some examples of how that might work because I think you've got somebody else validating and supporting. Um, however, around the media, yeah, I mean, we mentioned it, the National Travel Roma Inclusion Strategy recommends a targeted traveller and Roma communication initiative. It's really needed because at the moment it's kind of at the mercy of individual uh, journalists and their own approach. Um, some kind of sanction system, be it through hate speech legislation or others for, you know, you, you heard the examples Bridgie read, read out where people are basically in, inciting murder um, against travellers and, and there is nothing that can be done except report, report, report. Um, the other part about, you know, a platform for travellers to come together with the media people, you know, and set standards. Um, and training for, you know, maybe for traveller projects to learn more how it works, but definitely for journalists and media. 
Um, and I suppose the other thing just to say is the, you know, the Citizen Traveller campaign was run a number of years back, and that was a big national communication strategy around the many positives, and it gave visibility. And I was struck recently talking to one of my colleagues who'd be a Traveller woman, um, you know, who's been an activist for many years, and she spoke about as a young woman, it made a huge, profound impression of her, just seeing that positive visibility around identity and culture. So I think um, it involves partnership, and it definitely involves some kind of sanction mechanism and Absolutely. standards. Uh, sorry, Anish, we're up against the top. Uh, have you any concluding responses to any question? Um, I, I suppose just... Okay. Um, the recognition of traveller ethnicity didn't actually require specific uh, legislation and there are, spe there are uh, significant rights for travellers that are there in the equality legislation, in the housing legislation, but they're not being enforced and that's why uh, legal aid is so important and it should be extended to discrimination claims and there should be a clear entitlement to legal aid in, in housing cases. Thank you. And now I call on Colette, our rapporteur, for concluding remarks. You all spoke so eloquently and brilliantly that I'm not even going to attempt to the today. Um, uh, thank you, Maura, uh, to, to, to kind of capture it. Uh, we have the report and we will have conversations with you some more in the drafting of the report. So, you know, we're only beginning a conversation today. Um, there's so many challenges and so many heartbreaking, hurtful, dreadful stories that unfortunately people feel obliged to share to make us move. Um, um, and to move us. Um, but I suppose I also want to hold on to hope. And uh, there's a poem that always kind of gives me some kind of uh, comfort when I'm feeling that, uh, you know, uh, the world is against uh, us. And it's called uh, Sometimes by Sheena Pugh. And she says, Sometimes things don't go after all from bad to worse. Some years muscadel faces down frost. Green thrives, the crops don't fail. Sometimes a man aims high and all goes well. Sometimes people will step back from war, elect an honest man, decide that they care enough, that they, can, that they can't leave some stranger poor. Some men become what they are born for. Sometimes our best efforts do not go amiss. Sometimes we do as we're meant to. The sun will sometimes melt a field of sorrow. That seems hard frozen. It may happen to you. And I hope that our good efforts today will not go amiss and that they will lead to some better things. But I do recognise the enormous challenges. And the final, final word has to go to the Reverend Martin, Martin Luther King. He says, I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word. Thank you, Colette. On behalf of the Shannon Public Consultation Committee, I thank you all for your worthwhile contributions here today. And I think it's been a worthwhile uh, session. And I think we've all learned a lot from it. There's a lot we can take from it, certainly. And we will look forward to getting down with uh, Colette, uh, who will be doing a report. Full account uh, ha has been taken of today's discussion, and will, uh, when the draft report has been prepared, copies of the final report will be sent to all of you. Um, before the public hearing on this topic concludes, I wish to put on record my gratitude to all members of the committee for their hard work over recent months. In particular, I thank, of course, Colette who proposed this topic for discussion and who has worked extremely hard in the background in preparation for these hearings. I also wish to sincerely thank all those who sent in submissions to the committee and to the witnesses who appeared before the committee earlier as well as your good selves. And I wish to express my gratitude to the Secretariat and to Bridget particularly uh, from the Senate office for their valuable in input into this public consultation. And we will now adjourn Senate Day. This is that one.